En este momento inicia la transmisión en vivo. At this moment, the live transmission begins. We inform you that by remaining connected to it, you authorize Colombia Connect and the entities that make it up to record and disseminate this event. We invite you to share the link to the YouTube broadcast you are currently watching on your social networks with the hashtag Paz Ambiental. Dr. Stefan Peters, our host and director of CAPAS. Also, the professor of University of Antioquia and Semanin researcher, Dr. Jenny Leal Flores, and Mr. Rafael Aramendiz, founder and director of the company Suricata. Mr. Noel Amilcar Chapuez Gonzalez, representative of the Association of Indigenous Councils of the Awa people of Putumayo. Mr. Roberto Canticos, representative of the great binational family of the Central Awa facilities of Ecuador, and also Juan, Mr. Ms. Doris, Mr. Edgar Nastawas from the same organization, and Ms. Doris Puchana, also from the Agua Cubamari community, and Dr. Michael Nipper, professor at the Eustos Liebig University of Gießen at the Institute for the History of Medicine. Ms. Liliana Paz, coordinator of protected areas and climate change of the Eco Habitats Foundation and Ms. Mini Joana Bolaños, also associate, part of the Association of the Santa Clara Association of Pincha, and Mr. Cesar Abadia Barrero, Professor of Anthropology of Human Rights at the University of Connecticut and member of the Network Salud Paz in Colombia, and Dr. Juan Sili of the Fran Halfer Institute for Molecular Biology and Applied Economies, Economics, I am Eva Itacroname in English. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ana Maria Aguirre Cañas. I am the director of Colombia Connect. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and last day of the first interdisciplinary workshop of Colombia Connect, Fair and Sustainable Use of Biological Resources in the Post-Peace Agreement, organized in this version by the Colombia German Institute for Peace Capaz. Colombia Connect is a transdisciplinary information and knowledge network linking the fields of bioeconomy, biodiversity, and peace building. Our work is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Higher Education and Research. All the information of this workshop can be found in www.primertallercolombiaconnect.com. And if you want more information about Colombia Connect, you can follow us on Twitter at, as at colconnect underscore org and on instagram you can follow the account of the colombo german institute for peace which is the entity that has organized this workshop at instituto underscore capas in the transmission box in the youtube broadcast box you can also fill in a form if you wish to be sent more information throughout the day we will be as taking questions for speakers and panelists in the webcast chat Please always let us know to whom you are directing your question. Our team will make a selection of those questions and pass them on to us. Today, our workshop will focus on the discussions on development discussions, dialogue of knowledge and experiences, and we'll have four main blocks. First, two keynote lectures by Dr. Jenny Leal Flores and Mr. Rafael Aramendiz. Second, a panel on the dialogue of knowledge and experiences. Third, the projection of videos on Columbia Connect projects. And as a fourth point, and to close our workshop, we will have the intervention of Dr. Kwang Sin Lee. Let's start. Our first keynote lecture is by Dr. Jenny Leal Flores. She is a coordinator of the research group in marine systems and coastal systems from the University of Antioquia. She's a biologist with master's degree in tropical aquatic ecology and a PhD in natural sciences from the Bremen University of Germany. She is, her areas of interest are evasive ecology management and ecology of coastal resources. The name of her lecture is The Power of the Invisible, Appropriation, Social Appropriation of the Knowledge as a Tool for the Conservation of Natural Resources. So Dr. Leal, good morning, and thank you for accepting the invitation of Colombia Connect and from the Colombo German Institute for Peace. I will now give you the floor. Thank you very much to everyone attending and thank you for inviting me to participate in this session. Now I will share my screen. Me confirman entonces si están Please viendo. confirm if you are seeing my screen. Yes, we are seeing your screen. 
Perfect. Thank you. So I made a slight change in the title of my presentation because I thought it was a bit pretentious to talk about the conservation of natural resources in these current times. This is not such an easy topic. It's easier to manage this. And so this is a title that is an outcome of the different experiences we've gained with several research groups from the University of Antioquia in different steps or phases of the research path we've undergone. And since year 2008, more or less, that we've been working in the fish sector, fishing sector of the Urabá Gulf. This Urabá Gulf is located in the northern part of Antioquia and the southern part of the Caribbean. So those invisible for us are all those fisher women and men. It's a pretty invisible sector in the country. They are not acknowledged and they're always left last whenever there is an allocation of the priorities of the country. This is a sector that is always in the last positions. And curiously as well, the same cases for researchers that work in this topic, we are also left last whenever we have to talk about this topic in any public space. So definitely fishing and fishermen and women are not really at the top of the mind of as, as part of the populating groups or vulnerable groups in Colombia. And that's why we refer to them as invisible. And what we refer to power is what we've achieved to do is the social appropriation of knowledge in the work that, as I want to repeat, it's not only mine, I'm just the means to communicate this work. But this is the work that is the outcome of a great team composed by a lot of research teams and also professors, students, researchers in general of the Antioquia University. But overall, this has been a collective work with the community. So those who must be most credited from what we will see today and I will present today are the fishermen and women communities in the Gulf of Urabá. So we will first talk about some experiences of collective construction of baselines for the comprehensive management of environmental, marine and coastal environment and resources. And we will also talk about learnings about social empowerment. This will be a short presentation. I want to clarify that in the action scope in which we've um, worked on, since we've joined all these different researchers, professors, and students, is exactly the Coastal Comprehensive Management, or MIC by its acronym in Spanish. And it could be understood as the planning and organization that has been, and I want to highlight this word, agreed on of the territory, the marine and coastal territory, in such a way that we can guarantee economic growth and the distribution of benefits and the sustainability of the natural base. This is taken from the National Policy of Oceans and Coastal Spaces by its acronym in Spanish, PNOEC, which is published by the CCO, or the Colombian Commission of Oceans. This highlighted word is an emphasis that I personally make. Now, with this vision of the coastal comprehensive management, we take into account that the objective that is underlined in these processes that are done in this comprehensive management is the integration of the different interests of all the parties and actors and increasing the coordination amongst them and creating a space for an agreement between all these parties involved. So based on this, we, we move within this definition because everything that we're doing, this great team of people that I mentioned, were, well, we are always working within this framework with the communities directly, and we are basically agreeing on, on these topics with them as we move along. We started with an exchange activity of the, the sciences of the sea of the program ERICA by its acronym in Spanish. Spain and its regions exchange knowledge with Antioquia. And this was funded by quite an amount of organizations and led by the University of Antioquia. And jointly, we worked in the first participative approach of the problems of the fisher sectors in the 
Antioquia coast, and this activity was the outcome of those of that first effort. Once again, we worked this with a focus of in the coastal comprehensive management with a, the following methodology, a quick and participative diagnosis. And we worked in the municipalities of Turgo and Necacli, which consolidate around 85% of fisher people from the Antioquia coast. We worked it jointly with the University of Antioquia, the Governor's Office of Antioquia, and the foundation CETMAR. This is a Spanish foundation that has been working uh, joint joined by different Spanish universities, such as, for example, the University of Cádiz, Vigo, the Spanish Institute of Oceanography, also the University of Coruña, the University of Santiago de Compostela, and the University of Barcelona. They also collaborated and participated with Colombian institutions, such as the National University of Colombia with the branch in Medellín, the EAFIT University, the Corpo Uraba, which is the local corporation and entities and local institutions that had to do with the territorial entities, meaning mayorships, offices, municipalities, offices, in this case, where the SAMAs, these are the environmental secretariats of these municipalities. And the Secretariat of Agriculture and Environment, that is exactly what SAMA means, and also the umatas which are the equivalent of the amas in some municipalities where the pre the latter were not present and also guilds and communities that had to do with the fishing sector were also invited and they all participated in different workshops and activities that were carried out and this led us to be able to define several challenges and issues in the gulf that had to do with this fishing sector and these series of issues that we found were not very different from the ones that we had already foreseen, and they're not so different either from those that the rest of the country in different fishing sectors also live. For example, the the, te the deterioration of the coastal ecosystems. This is basically the loss of ecosystems and resources throughout all the Gulf, many times caused by erosion, also by sedimentation and contamination that is present in the environment. At that moment, we didn't have um, an organizing scheme for the fishing sector. We still don't have it today. Also, at that given moment, there, also, there wasn't an, an environmental organizing scheme. We were just starting the first efforts of the POMIUAC. This is a program for the organizing scheme of the Darien water body. All, I want to contextualize a bit here. All the coasts in Colombia are divided to be able to talk about the management of these areas in what is known as environmental coastal units. And they are divided in such a way due to their similarities, not only environmental similarities, but also administrative similarities in the issues and concerns that are relevant to those sectors in these places. So right now we are part of the Pomiwaka Darien, which is composed by the Chocuan or the Choco sector and Urava sector close to the Darien. So the plan that is developed to provide the guidelines in terms of the management of the resources or the use of the resources within a coastal environmental unit is proposed in what is known as a POMIWAC, which is the organizing scheme and comprehensive plan for this environmental unit, in this case, for the environmental unit, coastal unit of the Darien. At that moment, we just started to build and design this plan. It is led by community organizations, for example, Corpo Uraba and Corpo Choco for the two corresponding sectors. We are still working on this. We created a document that was approved by different instances and acknowledged by also different instances. And now it is reaching the previous consultation. And this is the most important steps. This is the approval of the communities of that content. We must clarify that in the creation of this POMIWAC document, as we follow the guidelines of the comprehensive coastal management, it was also worked on in a collective manner with all the communities of the region on behalf of these authorities. So there isn't really a great possibility for communities to object fully to this POMI walk. Why? Well, because it was built jointly with them. Now, the lack of economic alternatives for fishing communities was one of the main 
problems we found and also the lack of organization among the fishing communities they have great difficulty to organize themselves most of the organizations in the gulf and actually in the most territory in the country almost with all sectors not only with the fishing sector they all share a phenomenon and it's the following they organize as for example state aid programs are provided so for let's say there is an offer from a ministry or from a secretariat or from x and y entity that say okay we will provide aid to different associations and then we see that a lot of associations are composed or organized just to receive that aid and that has created a very difficult dynamic within the sector because the fish the fisher communities don't really have cohesion amongst them they are also not long lasting due to the lack of this cohesion and basically because they were joined just for a temporal objective an aid that is finite meaning after the end of this aid well that reason that shared uh, aim or reason why they are associated is no longer enforced or valid and so we have a lot of associations created in paper if you consult the databases of the different authorities you find a lot of associations organizations and so on but more than half of these are non-existent and the other half perhaps are currently disappearing and there are some that still survive with a lot of difficulties within them we find many difficulties to be able to learn to to work as a team to be able to accept failures in a joint manner and also understand that failures are joint are common amongst them and not just individual for example literacy low literacy levels in these communities and amongst these fishermen and women are difficult challenges as well to be able to give continuity to these associations so this is a, a quite a significant problem that we're learning to face and another problem and i want to highlight this last one here in my slide well this has become a severe problem that is really out of our scope and this also is shared among other sectors it happens not only with the fishing sector and coastal ecosystems and it's the very low linkage of state entities they don't really get or approach in a closely manner the different uh, communities that are facing these problems they have really little or low human resources we see lots of officials or sorry little uh, a few amount of officials that are in charge of many many issues and the officials that are in charge within the for example agricultural the uh, competent authority we only have two officials in charge of the coast and antioquia sectors without taking into account the antioquia coast is the most extensive coast of the colombian coast area so if we sum the coast areas they have to be in charge of a, a huge extension of the area of land but not only this they are also in charge of activities in the continental sector for also rivers and also water and other water bodies so i think it's a bit too ideal to think that these two officials can cover these areas so the lack of linkage of these entities is quite weak the invisibility of the sector is obviously a huge problem that makes it that the governments are not really prioritizing these sectors and therefore the in entities in charge are not prioritized either at the time of allocating resources, aid, support. This activity that we carried out had a certain important impact and thanks to the work that we did to this community, it was achieved and we had the opportunity to publish this that you're seeing now in the screen, which is called the Diagnosis and Strategies for the Promotion of, of an, an Equal Socioeconomic Development in the Antioquia Coast with emphasis in marine and coastal resources. And this was done because we were able to, the knowledge that it was published in this book was very, was seized because we achieved to disseminate the content of this book, not only with communities, but also with authorities. And this led to the creation of a milestone actually because it was the first time in our department that within the, the departmental development plan there was a specific objective for the coastal and marine resource as objective three of this departmental development plan and most of the actions and strategies that were included in this departmental development plan were an outcome of this publication exactly the 
findings and the work dynamic created in this activity also led us to create or propose a new project because we uh, entities and communities were very we're desiring to carry on with the following step we basically identified different problems and we said okay what will be the strategies that we will use to tackle these problems and one of the strategies where we need to start working on an organizing scheme for the fishing community so with all these different entities how can we do this how can we all the parties contribute if according to the regulation we are not competent enough to organize this organization scheme for the fishing sector we need to wait for the corresponding entity to do this so we joined us to create certain inputs that would be useful to the fishing authority and for this for, for when this fishing authority was ready they could create this organizing scheme and that's why this project was born which is the priority guidelines for the creation or the proposal of a fishing organizing scheme and the name or the acronym we use was LOPEGO by its acronym in Spanish. And this is a project that joined with other entities uh, we, we achieved to create it and we added to the royalties national uh, governmental system. And that was the first time that the royalties system started to to create this and we were able to be in this first group of the projects that were first funded. Of course, this implied a lot of challenges, a lot of needs to learn new lessons because this was something new for the country. Obviously, there were certain administrative setbacks, but these were all overcome. And this was a huge uh, teamwork. I just want to mention several professors and investigation and research teams that were very passionate and very participative in this process, and they continue to work for the fishing sector. Juan Felipe Blanco del Grupo de Investigación en Ecología. We work with Juan Felipe Franco from the Celicet Group and also Mr. Vladimir Montoya from the Territory Study Research Group, also Maria Velasquez Rodriguez from the Human Nutrition and Food Investigation Group, Mr. Alejandro Costa from the Biotransformation Research Group, and Richard Zapata from the Microbiology Research Group. It's important to notice the transdisciplinarity of this team. We come from different disciplines, and here we would have to start creating a list of more than 500 or 600 fishermen who participated in all workshops that we conducted and of course they are also the co-authors of everything that we were able to achieve with these projects here we focus then on applying the lessons learned from the previous project and we focused on the three first issues the insustainable use of resources the lack of biological knowledge and the lack of alternative productive alternatives for fishermen so we started to work with two main goals or with two working lines one of them would be to see which activities would allow us to organize the fishery, the fishers' activities, and also which activities allowed us to have alternatives so that when we can generate the planning rules, then the fishermen would have alternatives. We always need to have the planning or the organization of the resources and the comprehensive management of a resource. And of course, we would have to adopt measures that restrict the uses and that the communities can no longer use the resources in the same places nor in the same seasons or in the same amounts because we need to allow the resources to be recovered in the environment. This means that this sets challenges. What are we going to do with those communities when they cannot use the resources? And this is why in this project, we thought that we had to think about alternatives, economic alternatives that allow those communities to be engaged in other activities and therefore allowing them allowing the resources to be recovered we did create a baseline of that knowledge that was missing in the biological aspects but also in the socioeconomic and nutritional aspects so that we could research more or we could focus on the dynamics and the value of fishery resources this value wasn't just ecological but also economic and nutritional and also in terms of alternatives we were focusing on two types of activities which was the experimental growth of uh, fish species pargo and the planting of microalgae for aquaculture and with this we wanted to generate the knowledge that would serve as a tool for the generation of uh, organization and management public policies what are the impacts of this project? We left with installed capacity for the sectors, trained studies, publications, trained students, sorry, publications, and of course, all 
universities are interested in this and also the guidelines and the recommendations for the fisheries activities and viable proposals for the pertinent authorities we could say that this is the great impact that we created but unfortunately this great impact that we had in the area that we see here is not as large as we would have expected because of the institutional weakness the weakness of the authority hasn't allowed us to use these guidelines and recommendations that were generated right now or back then so long has uh, gone by this actually ended in 2016 and maybe we would need an update of the information but in that moment if they would have used that information we would have already had a fisheries planning or a fisheries plan because we actually need to say that this recognition that we have compiled with the communities this is what the communities want what they need this is what they think it's viable for the fishing plan and this is not just what the communities want and also this is what is scientifically viable feasible and also from the economic perspective this means that we did the work for them but because of this institutional weakness unfortunately it wasn't possible for them yet to truly use this information and to generate and create the fisheries organization plan they're still working on that and also the most important impact for us is that it's the impact that we had in the public management at the local and departmental level because with the support direct support with the authorities and the communities we were able to achieve fisheries inclusion and the protection of mangrove ecosystems which were the strategic ecosystems in the territorial plans in the municipalities of the Ecuador Buenacopli and also for the first time in the history of the Department of Antioquia we included it in the POTA but the second part wasn't thanks to us but we actually did provide support but also what is highlighted in red because that is probably the most important achievement is that the fishermen themselves by participating in workshops for the first time because they hadn't participated in these type of workshops this was the first time that they participated and they would sit down to talk to the people who were in those workshops by using the knowledge that they had gathered from the work that we have been undertaking with them and then when they said that they used the knowledge that meant that they used words of course with their own language but they meant technical and address scientific and technical aspects and defending and uh, argumenting why the mangroves were important for the fish species how the mangroves have to be included in the communities and how fisheries was providing sustainability to many families and how important it was for the fish species that they were fishing to have sufficient health and environmental well-being to be able to represent a proper sustenance so they all defended this and they were able to include fisheries as an agricultural activity not just of high priority but it was the one of the highest priority in the antioquia agricultural and livestock territorial ordinance planning antioquia pota and this led to the aspect that i was mentioning the institutional weakness in the authority responsible for the sector because at the time of turning this into a reality when we say okay this is going to be included because it was elected above banana and uh, which was traditionally the most important product in the region but now we had fishery and nobody can deny that this was because of the efforts of the fishermen but at the time when the governor's office wanted to include this in the territorial ordinance plan document they find an obstacle and it is not their competence fishery is not their competence according to our standards the fisheries is not the competence of the nation and therefore it could not be included there it had to this issue had to be forwarded to the national agriculture and fisheries authority so that they could do what the fishermen were asking for this means that we got sent back to the previous problem that we haven't been able to solve because this is an issue that is solved at a higher level and that we are trying to uh achieve from the basis and how the communities can do it by following this and 
empowerment process because if they were able to do it at the local level they can also do it in other levels mm -hmm. and this is why we continue to work and what we did as the next step as the local and departmental public management process together with felipe blanco who was part of this team and also based on everything that he had been working on by his by himself and other projects plus everything that we had achieved with the team of people and communities he accompanied the environmental secretary of the, of the department so that we could create this great achievement. And this is the first time that in the Department of Columbia, we can achieve this, that we promote an ordinance for the comprehensive protection of the mangroves in Antioquia. And this has allowed us to start also talking about fishermen because they go hand in hand. Fishermen depend on mangroves. So this was a very important milestone this was in 2019 and it was thanks to the efforts for uh related to social appropriation and knowledge that we undertook with these authorities because the appropriation of knowledge was with all the stakeholders and the authorities are also significant stakeholders so what are the lessons learned from all these activities we see that communities in all activities, they told us that the ordinance of the marine and coastal resources and environmental resources, that is the most urgent need. And if you think about it this way, this is actually the most urgent need throughout the country in terms of all natural resources in all environments. We need to have a true environmental ordinance in our country and what we see here in our region is simply a small sample of what is happening all over Colombia. This is a true ordinance and man management, mostly comprehensive management, which is the management that we have to undertake from and with the communities, but also for the communities. This means that men as the comprehensive part of the ecosystem and not as an enemy of the ecosystem. So this was one of the first lessons learned. And yes, that has to be definitely a priority. We need to have the comprehensive management of these resources and the weakness and the lack of articulation of the institutions in charge of the fishery sector, it continues to be an obstacle. This part, partly the empowerment of the communities can allow us to achieve this, but if there's no political commitment from the entity so that this sector can be uh, strengthened and therefore the entities responsible for the sector can also be strengthened and they can gain protagonism in the distributions of budgets and also resources in general within the state, then this sector of course will continue to be unaddressed and disregarded. And the main lesson learned of course is that the empowerment of the communities that depend on these natural resources, that is the best option to be able to achieve the changes that we want in the environment and the resources. Because by creating visibility of the fishermen, not because of our work, but because of their own work, and also the fact that they are now visible, that uh, they were included in workshops and meetings, and in other areas where they weren't included before, this of course, with this, we cannot deny the importance of fishery in the region. And every time we think about the agriculture and livestock sector, we have to think about fishery. And we also need to consider asking fishermen what they need and what they want. And also by learning all of this, we started to apply that the lessons learned. Two minutes left. So as a final conclusion of everything that we had done, the communities also asked us and they said okay don't reach research more please because we have had a lot of research already many entities come here and they carry out research they collect information but they we are not actually being benefited from the urgent of the urgent activities and also protect the environment so by applying what we learned, this is how we arrived at the project that is part of Columbia Connect, which is the participative aquaponics in the fishery communities in Uraba, Colombia, which is a tool for the promotion of gender equality and the environmental and socioeconomic sustainability. So we are listening to the communities. This is an important key in the social appropriation of knowledge. Our way of working with them is by listening to them and also adjusting our actions according to what they're asking. So right now we are following a line 
uh, from starting with diagnostics and learning about what they need. And now we're looking for solutions to the problems that they proposed with the solutions that they propose themselves as well. So these types of activities, for example, are part of the activities that they said themselves that we should undertake. So this is what I wanted to share with you because these are the results of the experience of working with the communities. As I said, I am not an expert in any topic, nor am I a scientist. And certainly after this, you will say, what is the, this lady doing here? Because I don't have the level of knowledge that maybe all the other guests will have here. But I just wanted to share this information with you. And this is um, information arising from the work that we have carried out with the fisheries committee uh, community sorry from the gulf of uraba thank you very much thank you dr leal special greetings to the participants joining us on youtube and if you have any questions you can send them over the chat to the panelists right now we will continue with the questions that we received dr leal which recommendations do you have to overcome the complications in the articulation between community organizations state entities and universities Well, by mentioning what we have learned, what has worked very well for us is that when we want to articulate at the local level with some of the authorities, unfortunately, not so much with the most important authority in the fishery sector, which is UNAP, but with the other authorities and especially with the communities, it is precisely to build with them from the beginning and to do something that is not common with the researchers which is that we do not give back to the community in the language that the community needs to listen to so that they can understand. And we do not give back to them with the necessary frequency. So what have we done in our projects? And also the beautiful thing about this is that colleagues that work in other areas that normally don't have any relationship with the social aspects, they have been involved here and they have started to work on their projects with the communities, even though they say, no, I'm just going to measure rainfall. And then, okay, well, you have to measure it with the communities. You can ask the children in the schools to measure it, and then they teach them to use these uh, rainfall meters. So this work with the communities, from the community, and also to come back throughout time. In the projects, we actually have constant socialization of our work. It's not as if we get there the first day, we tell them what we do. And then at the, at the end we say, oh, thank you. This is the um, leaflet of the work. No, that is not the way of giving back the community the knowledge that they need. We need to go out there, sit down with them and explain everything to them in the words that they can understand. We actually had to organize place so that the communities would understand what we were creating in the projects. So you can imagine these teachers, all of them used to sitting behind a desk and uh, reading scientific publications. And now to have to sit down and organize a play because so that the fishermen would understand the results of a project. So the key aspect is the language that we use, the ideas that we can go to the level that is necessary so that we can communicate clearly. And the key aspect is to involve them from the beginning in the process. And the authorities, there's a problem here. If they continue to be as weak as they have been, even though they want to get involved, sometimes it's impossible for them. Perfect, thank you very much. We have a second question. Tell us about your dialogue experience between the tradi traditional knowledge of the fishermen and the scientific knowledge. It was wonderful. It was wonderful and I actually already had experience in this dialogue process, but there were some colleagues in our teams that when we started to work in these research groups and in these strategies and actions, many of them had never worked with fishermen before. And now they are so in love with the process, even though they have not continued because there are no additional new projects in the area, they still think, I want to work for them, I want to do something for them, because they were very motivated, they were able to connect. But this was after the learning process, it wasn't easy. The first times that we came in there, 
and the researchers started to talk to fishermen, they would fall asleep. They would literally fall asleep in our meetings. And of course, we were very concerned what is happening. Well, of course, our language was not appropriate. We had to learn to speak to the community so that they would hear us. And now we are already at a level in generating trust networks because this is what we did with the methodology that we followed. We created some trust networks that are overlasting and now we don't even have to go to the communities and say, look, we have this project. They look for us and they say, look, teacher, we have this idea. What do you think about this? What can we do so that you can help us with this? Or we have this financing idea from an entity that came in and told us this. Can you please help us with this and we can work together? This, this means that we no longer have to go out there and convince them that we can work together. So the interaction has been truly wonderful. Dr. Leal, thank you very much. It has been a pleasure to have you in Colombia Connect to work with the San Marina Corporation and with the University of Antioquia. Thank you very much. So let us continue with the second lecture. Mr. Rafael Aramendiz has uh, environmental management masters and also international relationships. He is a chemist and a pharmacist from the University of Columbia. He is a senior executive in the area of biotechnology, life sciences, and bioeconomy with more than 30 years of experience in corporate sustainability, governance, and regulatory issues in multinational and multi-Latin companies in the agri-food sector in Latin America and the Caribbean. He has been a consultant for the United Nations, the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, the French Agricultural Research Center for Development, and the International Government Network for Scientific Advice for Australia. The, he's the founder and the director of Suricata. The title of his lecture is Bioeconomy, a valuable opportunity for inclusive and sustainable territorial development. Mr. Aramendis, thank you for accepting the information from the Colombian German Institute for Peace. Uh, the floor is yours. A very good morning. Thank you very much. And I will now begin to share my screen. Please tell me if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. I'd like to offer a very special thanks to the organizers, to Columbia Connect, and also everybody listening in the audience. Thank you for having invited me to participate. So I'm going to be talking about opportunities for land development in a sustainable and inclusive manner. I'd like to talk about land development because at the end of the day, when we look at lessons learned, well, it's about sharing our lessons learned with you when it comes to the matter of bioeconomy. Before I start my presentation, I'd like to extend a very special thanks to the different international agencies that have contributed so that this project could happen. So this research has been done with many organizations, for example, CEPAL in Santiago de Chile, also with the Inter-American Cooperation Group for Agriculture in Costa Rica, and with CIRAM from France. So there's a lot of work from a lot of agencies represented here, and that's what I'd like to share with you this morning. So, we have six main topics to talk about here. Firstly, we'll be talking about global challenges to be taken on by humanity. Secondly, responses to these global challenges. Thirdly, challenges to be faced to overcome the prior challenges mentioned. So I'd like to give you a vision of where these concepts come from. And I'd like to come to a proposal for bioeconomy we will not be able to understand what these main threats are. Well, then we can't come up with an appropriate response. Then we'll move to point four, which is the main concept here, which are the general application areas. We have worked on this help from the European Union, specifically with a consultant from France, an organization from France, and then six, seven, and eight, I'd like to give you some key examples of bioeconomy projects here in Latin America. So these are projects that are already underway. And finally, 
I have a couple of slides at the end to tell you about our lessons learned, specifically looking at bioeconomy and land use and sharing value about coming up with fair and equitable processes out in our territorial areas to make sure that value is shared with all stakeholders. First off, I'd like to look at global challenges. Humanity is facing several threats or challenges. Let's prioritize some of these. We could say that there are eight main challenges here. We have a global population which is in constant growth. I'll talk about this in more detail later on. As a consequence of a growing global population, extreme poverty and malnutrition are becoming more acute. So these are problems that already exist and becoming worse. We, saw, we see also growing demand for food because we have this issue of extreme poverty, malnutrition and hunger. So we see growing demand for food. We see also a reduction in arable land. We also see a, a reduction in the fossil fuel based economy. When it comes to this point, we see the need to find new alternative energy sources. We see the impact of climate change every single day. These are severe impacts. And the last one, we can see the current and future impacts of the SARS COVID pandemic. So this is a summary of the global challenges we are facing at a collective level as humanity. Let's have a look at these threats. Okay, so let's talk about the growing global population. If you look at how the global population is growing and the path that we are taking, we are almost 8 billion people and we have a growth rate of approximate 33% per year. So the United Nations indicates that by 2050, we'll be close to 10 billion people. And then by 2100, the population will be 11.2 billion approximately. And we see this intense population growth, growth and this places pressure on our agricultural food systems. And so we need healthier food and we also see an issue here related to climate change. This must be recognized so that we can talk about bioeconomy. The second point to look at here is that of extreme poverty, malnutrition and hunger. Here we have some indicators or data. In 2019, the FAO recognized that 10% of the global population was living in extreme poverty. That is equivalent to 736 million people, approximately. Malnutrition, again, the FAO in 2019 recognized that 8.9% of the global population suffers from malnutrition. By 2030, the FAO projects or estimates that there'll be 840 million people suffering from hunger and we are seeing strong changes in people's consumption and dietary patterns. So from 1997 to 1999, the change in diet was from 36.4 kilograms per capita to 45.3 kilograms per capita by 2030. So we have poverty issues, we have malnutrition issues and hunger issues and accelerated population growth. So that is the landscape that we are existing in, so we have to look at where the bioeconomy concept comes from. So when it comes to the production, consumption and waste of food, we have the following data. By 2050, global estimations suggest, so we're talking about just 30 years from now, no, a very, very short period of time. By 2050, we should have increased a global food production by 70% so that we can satisfy all of our growing population needs, but also food and protein needs. And we find food use and wastage, which is very alarming, even cruel, 
because between 33% and 50% of food that is produced in the world is not actually being eaten. And in Latin America, this is a very, very sad situation because we see 127 million tons of food that are lost annually. This is very, very sad because it's not only the population issue, but we also have the growing population, we have hunger, we have poverty, we have malnutrition, and then these food issues. And this is really aggravating our global situation. If you look at the reduction in arable land, it's even more complex because if in 1960, we had 3 billion inhabitants and there were 4.3 arable hectares per person. In 2020, the hectares of arable land available per person in 2020, sorry, in 2000, was just 2.2 hectares. And now in 2020, we're 7.8 billion inhabitants and we have 1.7 hectares of arable land per person. So when it comes to arable land, this is a very difficult situation. It's complex. If you compare our population and our arable land, what we can see is that the population increases and arable land reduces. And so the panorama from in the next 100 years, from 2050 to 2100, this is quite concerning. 70% of the global population will be urban in question of just 30 years. And we have enormous challenges to face when it comes to how to use land how to make land available for food and how to actually put food on the table of these poverty-stricken, hungry people suffering malnutrition and who need protein, but also looking at how we can manage the waste and bio-residue produced by these people and the impact that this has for climate change because we have so many more people in the world. And what are the climate and environmental impacts of this waste? So this is a landscape, it's complex, difficult. And if we look at the fifth challenge, we now come to fossil fuels. So we're coming to the end of the oil age. We're coming to the end of the fossil fuel age. It's becoming more and more difficult and costly to extract oil. And so large oil and gas companies are starting to make a shift and they're becoming biorefineries rather than conventional oil refineries, working with biomass there, which are renewable in a circular economy model. There's an important element here. We must here highlight that these new energy sources, whichever one we choose, will of course have to comply with very strict social and environmental standards so that they can be considered safe and reliable energy sources, regardless of which new alternative energy source we we choose, whether it be wind energy, solar energy, or thermal energy, or hydrogen energy, or marine energy. So, a wave energy, we see that uh, these are taking over fossil fuels, but they're also changing our energy networks or grids. So this is something else we need to take into account as a predecessor to the concept of bioeconomy. When it comes to climate change, which is the eighth, sorry, the seventh challenge humanity is facing, we have some very weighty concerns when it comes to our global interests. If humanity continues to grow in an unsustainable fashion by 2050, our GHGs will increase by approximately 50% and will sit at around 685 parts per million and will have a possible global temperature increase of between 3 to 6%. It's not 
it's not easy to eliminate this, let's say, in Karachi, in Pakistan or Baja California, where temperatures are already close to 50 degrees centigrade. This is causing serious impacts for the global population. What is happening? The Paris Accord are not being reached, and it is very probable that the global temperature will exceed two degrees centigrade, and this will have catastrophic impacts on the climate, on the population around the world, also on hunger. So we do need to make everybody aware of this. And of course, let's also look at what's happening with COVID, the current and future impacts of the pandemic when it comes to social, environmental and economic impacts. We have a series of challenges to resolve here and our consumption, our development and our use patterns need to be redefined so that we can respond to these challenges. So now we've got these challenges on the table and we need to think about what we can do. What do we do now? What needs to happen so that these challenges can be dealt with? And this is where we have our SDGs defined as a manner of responding to these challenges that face humanity, education, health, industry, land, ecosystems, etc., etc., are all covered in these SDGs. But facing the challenges that I mentioned, we have some challenges in the biosphere, then we have some that are related to society, and then others are related to the economy. And we need to come up with global partnerships to fulfill or comply with the commitment that the UN system has entered into. So entering into partnerships for the benefit of humanity. What I'd like to say is that if we do not work on the base, if we don't work on the four challenges related to the biosphere, if we don't work on OD, uh, sorry, SDG 6, which is related to water, SDG 13, which is climate, or SDG 14, which is related to marine life, or SDG 15, which is about land ecosystems, well, we're not going to be able to do very much at all to have an impact on societal challenges or economic issues, no? which is, is where we see the idea of global partnerships in favor of the environment. We have a lot of work to do and some important challenges to face. So what are the challenges to overcoming these threats? We have to mitigate the effects of climate change. Secondly, we need to protect the environment. Third, we need to conserve biodiversity. Fourth, guarantee food security. Fifth, maintain available resources. And sixth, of course, have economic growth, but at the same time, we must maintain and improve the base of natural capital. The three here in red are what I continue, uh, sorry, consider to be most important, and that's what I will focus on now because we will be talking about bioresources and ecosystems where these bioresources are located. And so in this context of biodiversity and resource availability and sustainable economic growth, always improving the base of natural capital is of course based on the bioeconomy. So we have risks and threats rather that we have these proposed solutions to to face these challenges with new tools and so this is where we start to see the concept of bioeconomy this is where we see the concept arise independent of which country or economic group or regional bloc does this i have just three examples here of bioeconomy strategies. We have one from Germany, one from Argentina. And one of the definitions, the most recent definitions, was that, that it was come up with in the 2018 forum. But there are always going to be guiding principles as part of the definition of bioeconomy. And there are four fundamental aspects here. Firstly, bioresources. There's no bioeconomy if we don't have bioresources and biomass. The second element is 
science, technology, and innovation and knowledge. That's the second element. The third element is the production of assets and services in different economic sectors. And the fourth element is transformation towards a sustainable economy. So creating a new economic model that guarantees sustainability. So if we integrate these four different variables, this can be expressed in the terms that bioeconomy is to produce processes and services by integrating technology, innovation, and knowledge to be able to produce new goods or assets and new services in different economic sectors, achieving in this way a sustainable economic transformation. That is the concept that arises from these challenges and from these different areas. So what is the promise of bioeconomy? Well, it is simply to try to grow with economic sustainability. This is not the ideal utopian scenario where it'll solve all problems. This is just an additional tool that is trying to grow with economic sustainability with four promises. The first one is to protect the environment. Second one is mitigate the effects of climate change. Thirdly, maintain the availability of resources and of course, conserve biodiversity. So what are the application areas of bioeconomy? Because we have seen that bioeconomy produces goods and services in different economic sectors. For example, in the health sector, in the environmental sector, regarding social, economic growth and food security. We will see some examples specifically, but this is the mind map of the different application areas of bioeconomy. And it's also important to observe that the different technologies and the different areas of work of bioeconomy are linked to these SDGs. So the ones in the outer circle are the SDGs, the ones in green are those that are more closely linked to most prominent examples of bioeconomy. So exam for example, if we're working in sustainable production of food, we will for sure impact SDG number three, which is related to health. If we will work on, for example, producing bioenergy or biogas, we will directly impact SDG number seven, the one related to energy. If we are working in biodesign, bioconstruction, we will impact SDG number 11, cities and communities. And if we're working in, for example, land, the sustainable use of biodiversity, we will impact SDG number 15, terrestrial ecosystem. So what's the most important to see is that bioeconomy has a direct relationship and the technologies of bioeconomy and the application areas of bioeconomy have a direct and clear link with the different SDGs and with the goals that have been proposed to be able to reach those SDGs. So I want us to now observe which would be the main application areas of bioeconomy let's see first the food industry and i will like to i would like to give specific examples of some of these areas for example lower loss of food also about evaluation and use of waste in the food industry and efficient use of these waste and increase in the quality of food or for example broadening other sources of food let's look at for example less loss of food or lower loss of food. This is a Colombian uh, company that is using actually the stem of barley and recycled timber or wood. And this is an application for new packages. Well, the advantages are reducing the use of water and energy. It also reduces the use of chemical products and it reduces the emissions of waste. Another specific example that happens in Europe, this is uh, the evaluation and the use of waste in the industry. What happens here is that the soy in which, from which the processes we find soy molasses, well, in these soy molasses, we produce an, a solid act an a lactic acid that can be polymerized to um, obtain a polyactic acid known as PLA to produce packages, medical equipment, or also, for example, different um, filaments for 3D printing. So just take this example. I now, this enters the health sector, for example, these medical equipment, equipment or the arts and graphics world with these filaments for the 3D printing. And these is all 
achieved through bioeconomic processes. If we now think about the different ingredients, it's a very quick scheme of how different sources, marine sources, can be used as sources with potential and varied and varied application, be it algae, microalgae. The traditional use of these foods, as well as crustaceans, is because we are learning about new functions and properties that can lead us that the components from these marine different sources can be used and seized as, for example, gels or stabilizing products or replacement of several proteins. This is a new source of work as well that is quite significant. Now, the attention of new bioproducts. Well, I think we have a lot of work in this realm. I would like to give you an example of a biorefinery plant in Argentina. This is an example of a company that is called Gumbu and has a project that is called Huelucan, based in Argentina. And through the different production of corn, the production of corn is integrated in a process, in a 360 degree process, because basically corn is a, then uh, transformed into lots of byproducts with a circular economy. So not only are we producing just corn, I am producing by I can or they are producing bioethanol, biogas, thermal energy, and the different affluents that come from the the feedlot go to biodigesters and then generate biogas or the waste of those biodigesters are used as fertilizers in the soil. So we see that there are new uses and new processes of bioeconomies. Another example also located in Argentina. This is an example of a group called Grupo Luki. They, through affluence from lemons, lemon crops, they produce biogas and that feeds their own energy process. And they also use those affluents um, coming from the production to as compost material and also to be able to water their crops. So application area of bioeconomy and health, what it can be done today is so critical in terms of pharmaceuticals, vaccines, also in phytotherapeutical products in terms of bio cosmetics with new pharmaceutical applications of new products. You have five minutes, Mr. Mora. Now, in the environmental area, we can have we can have different applications in biorefineries, new materials, and of course, the sustainable use of biodiversity or biological diversity. I want to mention here that biodiversity not only provides, for example, different uh, supply resources not only in, for example, pharmaceutical and medical products, biodiversity is also providing different regulation and support area in terms of air quality, climate regulation, and it also provides other elements such as, for example, tourism and landscape. So, I'm sorry, and the health and wellness in sector. So we need to consider these different applicable uses in terms of ecosystems and the support systems that ecosystems provide now. The different paths of bioeconomy have been contemplated in a quite vast project. This is a project uh, that was created in 2016, and there are six different paths of this bioeconomy. As I mentioned, the evaluation and sustainable use of biodiversity, eco intensification applications of, of biotechnology, ecosystemic services, also inefficiency in supply chains and refinery chains, and some key examples of bioeconomy in that time. I will just provide some examples. For example, in the eco incentification path, the creation of biofertilizers based on fungi and our biosclerer species, also production of biofertilizers done in Costa Rica and Argentina. We also have another project and a product on the production of energy as of waste uh, from the pork and the poultry industry. There are other examples, for example, the use of waste coming from uh, the from um caviac uh caviac um yeast also a project from haveriana university we see dr susana fiorentina they she is using extracts of anamu and dvdv in the fight against cancer and we also have other sophisticated projects in different supply chains such as for example uh, the residue or the waste of pineapple to obtain a microcrystalline cellulose that can be uh, used in different applications or using, for example, uh, different enzymes coming from the red waste of avalon, red avalon, with an objective to use 
in the medical sector by a company in Chile. So how can we apply those lessons learned? And now I want to talk a bit about the territories and the communities and sustainable use. The first learning that we've gathered throughout this time is that the basis of bioeconomy is in the territory. It is with the territories where the va where value is added. And to be able to use in an equal manner this bioeconomy is, we need to carry out an analysis with the support of communities. There won't be a bioeconomy in a territory if we can't carry out a public a population and demographics analysis and of landscape as well. And this is only achieved by adding value and knowledge from the territories with the communities hand in hand. So once this analysis of the territory is carried out, I can carry out an analysis of the different supply chains and value chains that are in the territories and also know and learn what are the previous experiences of bioeconomy, which are the line bases, A, B, C points, to then later create new value proposals and see what are the conditionals and enablers of bio businesses in the territory within their communities so for this to be possible what we've proposed and this is an exercise that should be well thought thought through is that if we're thinking bioeconomy businesses in the territories with the communities well what should enter into these businesses is biodiversity and what should be the outcome is benefits for communities and it's the entering to different markets. But for this to happen, we need to move two levers. The first one, which is, as we mentioned before, at the beginning, knowledge, science, technology, and innovation. And the second lever, which is funding without money, we can't really carry these projects out. So we will be able to transform biomass, biodiversity, and the different ecosystemic services into something that really benefits economically and socially the different communities and territories, if we will always take into account that there are levers necessary to move this and there, there are also support areas, we need human resources, we need adequate policies and regulation. We also need an adequate culture and services and basic services for this to happen. So now to close, this is my last slide. I would just like to mention, this is a project that was done through a, a call from Connect in the year 2020 and some challenges that were being proposed, specifically challenges, challenges in the cosmetics, biochemicals and textile areas, for example, regarding cosmetics is how can we become the different uh, the different starches or the different yeasts for new cosmetics? How can we also transform the textile waste to for to be um, input for other business lines. These are just some of the challenges and some proposed solutions in relation to these topics. So this is something I wanted to share with all of you. These are work experiences of over 20 years. I am really thankful for the possibility of presenting this to you. And I'm, of course, question open to questions and suggestions related to the topic. Thank you very much for your participation, your attendance, and for listening to me. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Adam Mendes, I will reply with the questions that we've received from our audience. The first one is, how can we make it so that these bioeconomy proposals can reach rural communities that have been partially distanced with and have, for example, no um, roads in good conditions to be able to communicate with others? Well, that means and entails what working with the territory means. And the idea here is to integrate the community to the different processes that are happening in the territory. I won't be able to work, and I want to mention the experience, the very interesting experience that Dr. Jenny mentioned from the University of Antioquia. I won't be able to work with the community in a bioeconomy process if I don't integrate the community in their knowledge, as well as their knowledge and their learnings. And if I don't or can't decipher with the community that chain. So how can I reach this? Well, I can go through territorial projects, royalties programs, through international cooperation. That's how I can access them. I can access them through territorial projects for, our, for example, the planning autonomous territorial program. So there are definitely ways, channels, the mechanisms to reach those communities. What is utmost important is that we really need to know the territory, learn the territory. The actor of these territories must be also part of these processes, either through or with international cooperation or through a royalties program or through international agencies. There are many projects undergoing in the territory. And for this, we need 
the communities to participate. We need the communities, perhaps through an email, through a phone call, through a phone call. They can say, look, I want to participate. That is how we will do this bioeconomy in the territories. It is with them. Thank you. And now a second question for you. Do you consider that it is necessary to start legislative initiatives to foster bioeconomy in the country? Or do you consider that civil society is the party that should take an initiative to start uh, broadening these applications of bioeconomy? Well, this question is quite interesting because I think what is the what is most interesting to tell is that there has been a really interesting dynamic in Colombia, Argentina, and Costa Rica. I think these are the three first countries that have advanced on this topic from a project and initiative standpoint. Even before the regulatory topic, I want to mention two key elements regarding this. The first one is that in this current government, we have a Misión de Sabios, or the mission of the wise. And one of the focus of, these, of this mission is biotechnology, bioeconomy, and environment. And within these, we there were certain recommendations, policies, and specific targets to make this topic, the bioeconomy progress in the country. And from this mission of the wise, we have a mission of bioeconomy. And this is a mission with whom um, a lot of communities are working and there are projects undergoing that are linked to this mission and there's also internships courses and if you visit the webpage of the ministry of technology innovation and research you will find new initiatives you will find new projects as well for small entrepreneurships related to bioeconomy such as training information territorial projects so colombia is certainly leading this process and in Colombia, we're seeing something very interesting, which is that initiatives are happening before the regulation topic. Basically, technology is advancing faster than the regulation. And this has been initiative of, of the authorities that this process can undergo without having it delayed due to legal delays or the regulation matter. So there is a really good state dynamic. There is also really good cooperational projects undergoing that have basically positioned Colombia as a very appealing spot in the international scope. Costa Rica and Argentina are also creating this before actually setting regulations or laws, decrees, and norms. They are actually creating and carrying out their projects and they've had really good outcomes. Argentina, for example, does not really have a specific regulation that states X and Y should be done. It simply works through different projects, resolutions, or ministerial agreements and in some way or other perhaps this also visualizes these topics much more so i think we're progressing in a in a good way we need to continue driving this topic and society the civil society should also link to this these topics to understand the value of this knowledge and understand that there are great possibilities and opportunities for all in the territory and for all communities thank you very much mr adamandis for your answers Yes, I would, I think you you have this, but I know that there are publications that you will share through social networks so that people who are interested can consult them, read them, comment them as well. And you also have my personal contact information if you ever need to contact me. Thank you very much, Mr. Aramendis. I would like to thank both speakers for your generosity, for your time, and for your marvelous presentations. So if the members of our audiences want to receive more information about Colombia Connected, you can please fill in the form about data management that is available in the YouTube broadcast that you're seeing right now. In this way, we will have your authorization to be able to send our newsletters, invitations to forthcoming speeches and workshops of these same topics. Now, Today, we feel honored and happy to be able to count on representatives from the Awa family, great binational Awa family, the Awa indigenous people, boundary people, that since ancestral times, inhabits Nadino, Colombia, and the northern part of Ecuador, towards the Pacific side. In Colombia, the Awa are represented by three organizations, the indigenous unit of the Awa people, the Cabildo Mayor Awa de Ricard, of Ricard, and the Association of Indigenous Councils of the Awa people of Putumayo. On the other side of the border, in Ecuador, Ecuador, they are represented by the Federation of Agua Centers of Ecuador. We will now have Mr. Noel Amilcar Chapuez Gonzalez. He is the representative and indigenous leader of the 
Awa peoples, and he is part of the Awa Tachchan in the Valley of Wawes, and he has been the governor of this Cabildo since year 2015. Since 20, 2003, he has led the process leading with youth, organizing different youth groups in the territory, and in the year 2006, he talked with the association ASICAP and Akal Awa, in, with, in which he has developed as a leader of previous con prior consultations processes. And until now, he manages the ASAWAP within the great binational AWA family. He has technological studies in environment, and he is a professional in social studies. Mr. Roberto Taicuz belongs to the Federation of AWA Centers in Ecuador. He currently directs the, uh, the great binational AWA family of the Federation of AWA Centers in Ecuador and OCAI from a parochial government. He's also finishing his secondary studies, and he has been president of his community. And Mr. Edgar Nastaguas represents the Hua Cabildo La Turbia, and he's an indigenous leader of the Awa peoples. He belongs to the Mika Association. He has been an indigenous governor in the Hala Turbia Reservoir, and he currently has a council position of the great binational Awa family. And Ms. Doris Buchana belongs to the Achi Achawis Petusa and the Awa. She is an indigenous defender of human rights and from a social approach, she has been an indigenous governor and council of Ricarte teacher, and she is currently the coordinator of the great binational Awa family. She is also a professional in public administration and a specialist in human rights. She is currently finishing a master's studies in human rights and governance. The title of this talk is the binational context of the great binational Awa family, territorial governance in in sorry katsu which means big house or big territory please take the floor thank you very much for accepting our invitation so right now i see that you're sharing your screen you have to turn on your mics please So we are going to check what technical issues we're having right now. It's going to take us a couple of seconds. Sorry about this. So while we solve our technical issues with the presentation, we are going to show you the mini site that we have prepared for our workshop. Right now, we are going to share our screen to show you the website www.primertallercolombia.com. On the first page of this website, we have the broadcast of these sessions that we have shared, both in English and in Spanish. These broadcasts come from the YouTube channels of the Samarin Corporation, which is a broadcast that we've been watching in English, and the broadcast in Spanish is from the German Colombian German Peace Institute. In the second page of the website, you will find the agenda of the workshop. It's divided into the different blocks with the names of the panelists and the conference speakers, including the times of their interventions and their topics. And the third section of that website, we have the academic description of the panelists in this workshop. On day one, we will find information about the sustainable use of biological resources in post agreement. Number two, we have uh, environmental justice. Number three, day three, environmental peace. And day four, dialogue of knowledge and experiences. So we invite you to visit the website and share it, www.primertaller.com.
ColumbiaConnect.com. So let's continue with the next presentation. The second talk will be given by Ms. Liliana Paz. She is the coordinator of uh, protected areas and climate change of Equa Habitas. Ecologist, candidate to a PhD in environmental sciences from the Universidad de Calca in Colombia. With more than 15 years experience in participatory planning, the management of protective areas, strategic ecosystems with uh, indigenous and local communities, she focuses citizen knowledge by strengthening the knowledge and the capacities of baseline organizations for territorial management. Since 2014, she's also guiding rural planning processes for the adaptation in climate variability by approaching food sovereignty components, gender and participatory systems, and agroclimate alerts. She will be giving a presentation with Mediona Bolaños. Because of the legacy of her family by promoting conservation in the Santa Clara neighborhood in the Argelia Calca municipality. She is responsible for organizing the conservation processes in the neighborhood agreements in the municipalities of Balboa. She is a member of the group of women producers in the pilot project for just use and the conservation of uh, material resources. They are going to talk about territory in dispute and the role of community participation for conservation and the use of biodiversity. The floor is yours, welcome. Thank you very much, Columbia Connect for inviting me. I am going to start sharing my screen. Just give me a second, please. Thank you, we can see your screen, perfect. I'm very thankful for inviting me to this session. Today, we are going to talk about a specific territory, Argelia Cauca, in the southwestern region in Colombia, a municipality that unfortunately has been identified generally by all the conflict or public conflicts. Today, we are going to show the beauty of this territory, not just its local and farmer communities, but we also want to show you the large biodiversity and the work that these communities are undertaking in this transformation and change process. Eco Habitat Foundation was established in 2005. We are a group of different professions and careers focused on natural and social sciences. And we embarked on the task of strengthening those community governances of the local communities. We wanted to use the languages that normally can be different between the communities, the local government and private initiatives, and to be able to create harmony between all these initiatives in relation to these social processes. Of course, by developing territorial planning methodologies and also promoting sustainable agriculture adapted to climate. We always want to give an additional boost to local communities so that they are the ones that create dynamics and they can build their own territorial dynamics. In this sense, we implemented a territorial adaptative management process. And in this case, for the municipality in Argelia, in the mountain ranges of Pinche specifically, we focus on two situations. First, the conservation of biodiversity, but also the process to the adaptation process to climate variability. Of course, the gender perspective is very important. And today we are going to show the planning for the conservation of uh, sustainable resources as an effective management for the community empowerment and also for the positioning of these territories in the different situations 
related to public conflicts. So here we are going to show you the location of this territory. We are located in the southwestern region in Colombia. This is an area of high biodiversity. This is a key area for the conservation of biodiversity. And these are areas that have been identified by academicians at the global level as a single place that has to be preserved. The area of work is specifically in the municipality of Argelia in the mountain ranges of El Pinche. So, of course, this is known to everybody, and it's not weird to hear, hear about the news in these uh, territories. We hear all these different news on TV, especially recently. This is a territory that has been historically affected by armed conflict, territorial disputes, as we all know, the production of coca as well is one of the main productive activities in that region. Right now, this municipality is experiencing a territorial dispute between armed groups. We can clearly see this in the news. And this is a situation that we cannot deny. But what we want to highlight here is how in the midst of this situation where these farmers have experienced this situation from the moment they were born. They have a clear commitment. Uh, they are clearly committed to sustainable use and the conservation of the environment. And how in the midst of this conflict, they can promote these initiatives by supporting them in a clear and transparent way. In the sense, this is a territory that is regulated, of course, by different territorial planning instruments. We also have forest reserve areas in the Pacific region, Law 2 of 59, which were just established in 1959 for the protection of resources. And the municipality of Argelia has 59% of its area within a forest reserve, which is the Pacific Forest Reserve. And this has some serious implications for the territorial development of the region. At the same time, there are conflicts due to cartography outdates. It, the cartography of the region is outdated. And right now, the mountain ranges of El Pinche, if you ask the Ministry of the Interior in the cartography basis, we can see that it's outdated. And this, I want to emphasize that this is just a cartographic issue. And right now, we do not have information, updated information, they, the information says that there are only Afro communities, but that is not true. We also have farmer communities. And this is just to show you quickly the different scenarios that we see. And these are the situations that these communities are in. And therefore, the local territorial planning activities and actions are limited by these reasons. We have also the moorlands and the domination of the moorlands, in this case, in the Cerro Plateado complex. It has been delimited at about 1,800 meters above sea level and higher. And also we have the ordinance for basins. We also have the forest ordinance for the Bikai Basin. So we have all these rules, the standards and territorial planning uh, rules. We also have the POT uh, as well. And we also have the territorial development plans as well that are seeking or looking for alternatives for all these communities that have lived in these public conflict scenarios. However, all these tools and all these planning instruments, when you go out there to the territory, you see that they do not have an effective action. There's, this means that there is no robust action that proves or shows the strategies that are being established in each of these planning instruments. When we put ourselves in the shoes of the producers, of those who live in the territory, we do see that there are great limitations, but there are also great opportunities. And I think that the great opportunities is to plan from the territory, how the communities themselves and how us as organizations, it could be NGOs or maybe government organizations as well, in the framework of each of our competencies, how we can create tools, how we can contribute with knowledge, how we can contribute articulation and management so that we can restate or restore this environmental governance. Because it is the local communities 
through their empowerment in the territories, this is how it's going to allow these processes to be undertaken. Just to give you a brief context of the chronology of these biodiversity use regulations. In the 80s, we had communities of three areas. They joined efforts to promote their efforts. In the 90s, there is community interest for the conservation of the neighborhood areas of El Naranjal and Santa Clara, and they legally established the Serrania El Pinche Association. This is just an example of the minutes that they created as a community and the agreements that they reached in their different communities, and they established their own rules, their own regulations. And as of the 90s, this is a minute, these are minutes that date back to the 90s. We have Agustin Rengifo. He was one of the first colonizers in these territories. And from the moment he arrived, they started on the process to create awareness for the conservation of their territories. And in the 90s, they started to say that they need to preserve these mountain ranges because water can uh, disappear or because the animals could uh, be depleted, because wood could be depleted. And we understand all of this. These are just some images. Of course, we have some new and old photos here of the communities and the actions that they have undertaken in the territories. In the year 2000, we established a partnership with between the Echo Habitats Foundation and the Agro-Environmental Association, and this allowed us to strengthen the actions of these communities. We are always the lever that allows them to continue on their path. At the time, this allowed these areas and these communities that have been designed for conservation to be declared as protected reg regional protected areas managed together between the autonomous regional corporation of cauca as the environmental authority and the community then in the last decade from 2010 to 2021 the association became stronger we worked together by joining efforts and presenting projects to international cooperation. And we knocked on many doors, not many were open to us, but this has allowed the association to become stronger and that the local communities can see how the territorial planning works and how it could be the key that would give them access to many other opportunities that are not just conservation, but also incentives for conservation. And these are basically productive practices that are sustainable. All these actions have allowed us to go from a very local initiative of the neighborhood area, areas of Santa Clara, Naranjal, and Las Pilas. Now they have a scope of action in the middle of the municipality, and they are starting to work in the other municipality next year, which is Balboa. Because of biodiversity, of course, this is an area that uh, with 18% of the bird species in Colombia, we have conducted different inspections with the communities, with different scientists. There are new species for science, and therefore there are endemic species. We have San Barrito del Pinche uh, hummingbird. We also have this yellow bird, Paliante Colis, which was discovered some years ago. We also have Marisala, which is a frailejo that is only found in the moorlands, and they have been protected by the communities. And of course, we have the ecosystemic services that are being provided by this area. These neighborhood or regional ag agreements, the idea is that they are not just handwritten and now they are digitized, but they continue to be the basis for territorial, for local territorial planning and also the basis for conservation. We hold different gatherings and meetings between the communities and us where we share these territorial situations, the idea is that the communities understand all these different scenarios based on the different territorial planning tools and how they can contribute or also which limitations this implies for them. You have three minutes left, please. This has therefore allowed us to that the initiative has been 
recognized by TICA Colombia. This is an initiative part of a global network, and the mountain ranges of El Pinche are already part of this. This is just the third scope of action. The area in dark green is a protected area that has been declared seven thousand forty seven hectares and there's in there's an initiative for expansion which hasn't been effective because of the community councils now from the perspective of natural resources we also have incentives for conservation we have uh, organic production greenhouses and this has allowed women and families to change their perspectives about productivity an important thing to be able to reach the development goals is the management of the soil or the land. We can talk about water ecosystems and others, but the practices and the relationships of human beings with that land, that's what determines all the nutritional changes that we see from now on. There are many farmer communities as well. These are just some uh, pictures and we are very thankful to them. And right now we want to give the floor to Joanna Bolaños, who is one of the leaders who has allowed us to have all these change processes. Mini, please tell us briefly about these conservation agreements that can actually allow the planning of the different uh, neighborhood territories and how this organic production has affected women in instead of the production of a coca with chemical inputs. Thank you very much. Good morning to you all. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I am speaking to you from the heart of the reserve so that I can tell everybody about our process. Right now, I am in the township of Santa Clara in the municipality of Cauca. We started to expand our experience with the conservation process in protected areas. We have been able to tell other municipalities and townships such as Balboa about defining our own conservation areas, which is a benefit of the community and for the community. We have been able to work and show them that the processes that are led by the community, which is the the community is actually the key foundation of everything. And this will go generation after generation for many years. In some pictures, I saw that I was just a little girl. And with the knowledge, with the time, and with the support of Echo Habitat Foundation, I have been able to go out there and share my knowledge with other townships and municipalities. So it's very important to have that. The main foundation of a process is the community. And the agreements that we reach in the communities from our territories and for our territories. When it comes to the initiatives that we have been working on with the Eco Habitat Foundation, we have been looking at growing our own food and at the importance of producing what we consume. We have realized that many products come in with a lot of chemical ingredients. And so we've been working on building greenhouses to grow organic products. So for us, as leaders, as women, as homemakers, we want to have our own resources. We, during the pandemic, we have seen that many people have not been able to access food. So on our farms, on our land, fortunately, we've been able to make our own products and not suffer this difficulty that has been faced around the world. This is extremely important. We have to take care of our natural resources. And so it's all about our food safety. So the legacy of our families is to recover our own source of food and to return to the land and find our own seeds to implement this project and do so for many decades. Thank you very much, Nini. 
Okay, we have a very short time left to tell you about what this has all meant in against this very difficult backdrop. It's not always easy to work in this municipality, but the commitment made by our Indigenous communities to move forward with their conservation initiatives is always a source of motivation. So two reflections to wrap up with. When it comes to conservation of biodiversity, this is the only place in the world where we have certain species. So we have endemic species that are not found anywhere else. These conservation processes should be based also on the connection to land that we see that these local communities feel. When we declare these areas to be protected areas and any kind of legal mechanism, it's important that the communities understand that this protected area is no longer part of their land. There's a third party that will manage this land, whether this is an environmental authority or another one. So what is key is that all of these protected areas that they are defining, or when we have an area that becomes a protected area and there are local conservation initiatives, that there are regulations related to land use and that these be respected by the community and that are complied with by the community. The second reflection that I would like to close with is the reconfiguration of the relationship between the human being and nature, human beings as part of nature. While we have promoted these initiatives, looking at new economies, looking at the bioeconomy, what we see in these areas is that these relationships have been broken to some extent. And so what we need to start to do is to go back to basics and think about food sovereignty and look at these land use practices that have applied locally. And we need to examine the foods that we are producing and consuming. This is a clear example of the how. In a municipality with enormous challenges, initiatives, working with strength and community perseverance will always facilitate any initiative moving forward. What's key here is that funds actually reach the local stakeholders or actors who are truly carrying out effective conservation and sustainable resource management actions. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to share our experience with you. And Nini and I are both here available to answer to any questions or respond to any comments you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this marvelous presentation. So at the end of all the presentations, we will receive questions from the audience. We'll now hear from Michael Naipa. He is a professor from the Gießen University in History, Anthropology and Medical Ethics. He's a doctor of medicine from a German university and has a focused on medical anthropology in Ecuador. He has clinical experience in pediatrics, tropical medicine, and internal medicine. His areas of interest are historical perspectives and anthropological perspectives on social medicine, global medicine, and human rights, with an emphasis on indigenous and migratory populations. His talk is called Dialogue Between Knowledge and Experience. Reflections from a foreign expert. Please go ahead, doctor, and thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much, Ana Maria, and thank you to the organization for this invitation. I'm going to talk about some slightly different matters, but uh, it's been fascinating to hear from the previous presenters. And I hope that we will have an opportunity to hear from even more contributors today. I'm going to talk from a more theoret theoretical, historical, and anthropological perspective. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the role of the international expert. The project that we are currently working on is a regional project. And so we, of course, need to reflect on this dimension of the experience. I just have a few observations and reflections to share. And so. Let me share my screen with you, if I may. Let me confess something. This is not a project that was carried out in Colombia, but rather this is an empirical and field work carried out in Ecuador over the last 30 years or so. And 
I am now starting to work a little more with Colombia, but from afar, because the pandemic has obviously been an insurmountable issue. And so that's what I'm going to share with you here. So let me share my reflections on the role of people such as myself, so-called foreign experts who are working on knowledge dialogues and experience dialogues, which is, of course, the topic of interest today. As I've already said, I have worked in Ecuador in the Amazon region, and I have a specific interest in indigenous health. I've been interested in learning about perspectives that are distinct to my own and understanding the perspective of the other without supposing that I might be able to understand or repeat that as a separate individual. It's more about an approach, and I believe that this approach is important for all kinds of collaborations and dialogues. Medicinal plants, which are at the heart of a project that I'm currently working on, with Vanessa Giraldo, these plants have not always been my focus of interest, but the issue of medicinal plants has always been very much on my radar uh, from an anthropological perspective. And so now I'm going to talk about the two decades of participant observation, working on what we call intercultural health, where medicinal plants play an extremely important role. That's not the only aspect to consider. And I think when it comes to these medicinal plants, there are other possi possibilities at hand to understand the perspective. So that's why I'm going to share my reflections to elaborate a little more on this. So I think I have around 10 minutes to speak, and I'd like to talk about three central points. I'd like to talk about the role of the expert, looking at my own experience. Then I'll be talking about knowledge and experiences. And finally, I will focus on dialogue, which is not only an attitude or an activity where you have two or more people exchanging experiences, ideas, and carrying out projects together, but it's also about creating new perceptions, realities, and also misunderstandings, which are important to recognize when it comes to these work processes. And then at the end, some final reflections. So, I don't know how to draw, but I wanted to represent in a graphical fashion what happens between foreign experts and locals. So this is a comic I found when I arrived to Quito in 1992 for the first time. And I was very interested in learning about what's happening locally. And this reflects my attitude when I first arrived, you know. I'm the conquistador, I'm going into Conca. And there's this attitude that the expert has of being above the other. A lot of the time, as experts go with the attitude that we want to go in and talk to populations about what we consider important, and it's talking for talking's sake. Here we have the person receiving the expert. And so the local's answer is, look, OK, well, we have a lot of knowledge, and we would be more than happy to collaborate with you. But the expert does not perceive that. And this has happened to me many times my intercultural work, especially in medicine. As a doctor, I don't know if there are any other physicians here amongst the audience today. We are educated in such a fashion that we learn to be seen as experts. No, when it comes to anything related to medicine and health, and this creates multidimensional hierarchies, which we can see here in this comic. And so when there's a dialogue based on intercultural knowledge, then we see a social, political, economic, etc. hierarchies that come together. We also have different interests on both sides, and that's what the comic is talking about. In every situation, every project, we find 
obvious interests, so obviously an interest in the central topic being investigated, but we also see economic, social, professional interests that belong to the local stakeholders, but more than anything else to the international experts because they're coming in with research in mind, with certain publications in mind, and also with their own logics of interaction. There are also multiple assumptions on both sides based on prior experiences and different discourses, the prejudices and often negative prejudices or biases. This is a situation that arises in all societies, but it's very marked, very clear when we look at uh, the historical and current circumstances in each country, in this case in Ecuador, in Colombia or in Germany, in accordance with local reality. So we have to think about the socio-economic and political context that we are working in because that will always differ. When I think about a dialogue around medicinal knowledge, which experts do we believe to be relevant? And so, this in some cases relates to medicinal plants. This is a fantastic book that I read in Ecuador during my time there. There are many, num a great number of publications available. In fact, they have an enormous bibliography of available publications about medicinal plants and traditional medicine that had a focus on medicinal plants above all else. So this is a very important dimension, but it's not everything. So we often assume our epistemological hierarchies in Western medicine versus and natural scientists. So as doctors and as scientists who have been trained in other areas, we think that an investigative or research priority is to look at our own types of science and medicine without paying attention to medicinal plants. Usually in medicine, we look at plants and look only at their active ingredients. Then there's a socio-cultural dimension, for example, the practical use of medicinal plants amongst local populations. We look at that uh, as a clue as to the use of medicinal plants, but we fail to pay attention to identity. And so, it's a, about medical training, but also looking at the intersection here. There's a very strong intersection between what we believe to be important and then what actually happens when we're in the field. And that's why the products that we create in our scientific work and in our communications must always be or involve the question, okay, how are we truly reflecting the products of the knowledge dialogue and local indigenous experiences? And so I learned a great deal about the multiple dimensions and the meanings of medicinal plants and practices, traditional plants, concepts, etc., notions, words, rituals in the indigenous sphere in Ecuador. I really had to be forced into this. It took me a long time. And it was about having contact and communication with the local population. And so, working in the health field, uh, there was somebody who was really sick of working with me and came and said, look, I'm sick of working with you, Michael. You always want to have a clear, a rigid definition of what one thing is and what another thing is. No, 
you want to have a clear idea of the scientific name, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not how it works here. We have different names for the same plant uh, according to the context which we come across them in the time of day, where we are located, et cetera. Maybe in Germany, you can put everything into conceptual boxes. We open those boxes, we throw things in and we close them. But he said to me, look, if you keep working like this, I won't work with you anymore. And so that really helped me to open my mind, or you could say forced me to open my mind. And I still needed to work uh, further on that and really build trust to come to an agreement. The last point that I would like to mention is that in the dialogues that we have had around indigenous medicine in recent decades, I think that this dialogue process has not always been held to the same standard or at the same level. And we saw multiple actors with different levels of influence, and this has created a new reality. This has also led to certain misunderstandings. And I describe this as the indigenous traditional medicine emergency of the 20th and 21st centuries. Have we developed new practice practices and new knowledge? Yes. But these ancestral practices existed a long time before Western medicine. But when it comes to structured indigenous medicine, etc., it's about the definition of types of medicine, building institutions and writing books around indigenous traditional medicine is an additional process that will take a long time. We've seen a boost in historical development inspired by Alma Ata's processes and also an interest in alternative health systems, above all else in Asia, uh, where we saw the establishment of the perception of traditional medicines for example, Chinese medicine or Indian med medical practices as ones that existed in parallel to Western medicine. And it was imagined that these alternative medical systems existed all around the world. And this has brought us to a process of perceiving what has been found as something similar as health systems. And we have to find this in accordance with Western patterns, which are the so-called traditional health systems. And this has created hierarchies amongst professionals looking at diagnostic medical practices and illness. It's not only about content, but about structure. Two minutes left. Thank you. And this has been promoted by several factors in the political context of, for example, the indigenous knowledge as part of societies. Even administratives and healers could also uh, employ their practice only if they were acknowledged by the Ministry of Health, while their practices were also spiritual or whatever. They could also have other meaning that perhaps a normal physician or sorry, the indigenous uh, medicine person would be acknowledged in this way and this would lead in a medicalization. And whenever there were tourists or foreigners, this would also lead to a commercialization of the traditional indigenous medicine. And this has been, the question is, has this been a real acknowledgement of indigenous knowledges? That is a an ongoing question and also there's been a reduction of space of these knowledge and experiences in local and indigenous communities in the day-to-day -day life so we have traditional medicine has there been acknowledged but in the daily lives there weren't there wasn't enough space for this and there are also multiple interpretations of this um, dialogue of knowledge which we're talking about today and up until now which may be an ideal option to identify and understand problems and needs in population health so it's also important to carry out these reflections and i think we also need these deep and continuous reflections from experts it's not just enough to say I want to collaborate in a good way, but we must reflect about these topics in a continuous manner. We need time. There is a very beautiful article about the slow research and how to work ethnographics uh, or work with ethnography as a methodology. And we also need to maintain the space for knowledge and experiences of indigenous and local populations, as we've seen before, due to the struggle of territories. And I think this topic is very important so that these 
can maintain as a significant part of the real and day-to-day -day life of populations. Thank you all. Dr. Knipper, thank you very much for your presentation. Now we will have the participation of Dr. Cesar Abadia Barrero. Dr. Abadia is an odontologist from the National University with a PhD from medical odontologists from Harvard University, and he's also fellow of the Connecticut University, and he's a member of the Red Pass Network in Colombia. He's carried out several research in multi-method programs about policies in health and social security. He currently studies the relationship between new childhood epidemiology, epidemiology, immunology, and toxic loads in the U.S. And he's also progressing an investigation with indigenous and peasant communities about the good living and environmental degradation within the framework of the peace accords in Colombia. The title of his talk is Identities in Transition, Good Living, and Interculturality in the Process of the Peace Process and Climate Crisis. Dr. Abadia, thank you very much for joining us and good morning to you. You have the floor. All right, thank you very much, Ana Maria, and hello to all joining us. They and everyone, and you will see the presentation hopefully by whenever my screen sharing starts so as the title as was mentioned the title of my of my talk is transitions good living and within the framework of the peace process and climate change and it has another subtitle which i hope is clear towards the end between the iap and scientific investigations to promote the good living and restore the human and nature relations as you can see we have the support of several institutes and there are people that have also collaborated, but this exercise, as mentioned by Professor Michael Nipper, is part of an initial effort that we are doing in collaboration initially with Vanessa Giraldo, whom I hope you also had the chance to see her. If not, please look at the presentation that she gave on day one of this event. And with the small settlement of El Manantial and Sunuki, we've worked in a first project on medicinal plants that has been promoted by the Capaz Institute, but also in the institution where I work currently, the University of Connecticut, specifically the Human Rights Institute. We, cre we created an association with the Amazon University and hand in hand with these institutions, Vanessa and I as member of, members of Salud Paz Network, we achieved to carry out this supporting work to the different community initiatives and the University of the Amazon led by Professor Reyes and others, other collaborators. And as you can see, this is the, the, the meaning and the purpose of Colombia Connect to make these different partnerships and for us all to walk in the same direction. So my presentation has an academic profile very similar to Mr. Michael's, Professor Michael's presentation, but I hope it is useful. To start, I have this photograph from the Humboldt Institute, whom we've started to exchange all, also in a very exciting way. But we all know that the context of the final peace accord carried out in Colombia is now opening up a new violence cycle that is mainly affecting environmental and social leaders as well as journalists we know that for the second consecutive year colombia is the country with the highest number of environmentalist activist killings and that is very severe for the peace accord and all processes of environmental justice but beyond the figure in itself what we should reflect upon is why why is it so dangerous to protect the environment why is it so dangerous to think about those human nature relationships in a different way and which are the interests behind these that different proposals on environmental management are really not um, being acceptable in a way and we saw it in the peace accord let me just go back one slide so it was mentioned and it is still mentioned in significant portions of the peace accord the principle of welfare and the good living that is actually one of the most um present principles of the peace accord and 
even in the comprehensive rural reform, we have, for example, here mentioned all the rights of communities to welfare and good living. And when we started to carry out a more deep analysis on how these where we see that there are these are concepts that are mentioned and they even have different definitions or they are part of different paragraphs in the Pisa Court and studies from the sociology of law we know that these accords well this accord that is part of the constitution of our country well these obey to a series of historic tensions from different fronts and these accords in legal processes also have their a life of their own when these are appropriated so what is in paper in laws is is the fruit or an outcome of a negotiation process and these are also developed in different ways however what we try to analyze and start to analyze is that there are different ways of analyzing and contemplating of what welfare means and good living means as well as it happened with the constitution in 1991 in colombia there are several contradictions with the for example the spirit of good living which we know that is a construction that comes from indigenous and andean specifically communities but it is part of an indigenous cosmogony at a global level and these entail concepts life related concepts that are very similar to good living or this more harmonious relation between nature and humans and one of the most interesting aspects of these projects that we've been carrying out is that when we think about the peace accord or when we start thinking about the different local efforts that are undergoing to be able to develop environmental or territorial peace and to be able to achieve the transformation of these human nature relations which are in general terms exploitation or destruction ones due to this colonial legacy well indigenous peoples remind us that these frontiers that were created and these borders that were created in the independent uh, national national movements and obviously after the colonies are obviously artificial borders that obey to political structures that not necessarily um, are coupled with the ways of social organization of the communities or ways of social organization of uh, in between human beings and nature for example when we think about the andean amazon and atlantic corridor we think that or we see that there are local efforts of nature restoration for example or different agroecological efforts to that exploit to the industrial exploitation well these basically are in friction because these surpass or go beyond these artificial frontiers or borders to define what are territories and so this explains to us which is very much more logical to professional in biology ecology and so on but for us who perhaps are within the social studies or social sciences realms we see that some tensions are created because we think that actions are very limited under a territorial perspective well these perhaps not necessarily correspond to the different ecological constructs to which these actions that are being carried out obey to and within this framework well as i previously mentioned in the first proposal that we carried out with professor miguel Vanessa and with the support of CAPAS and in this and the Institute of Human Rights from the Connecticut University, we accompany different communities of the settlement of El Manantial and other close or surrounding settlements to talk a bit about medicinal plants as these other beings who have also suffered as well as humans the legacy of war and violence but as also mentioned by vanessa in her talk these have been deeply fundamental for healing processes that happened after the peace accord and moreover we've started to understand that there is a mutual need to heal both plants and humans humans and territories we both need to carry out processes that are not exclusively just about biological restoring it's about also emotional restoring and therefore it is necessary to have other rituals other interpersonal relations and interspecies relations to allow ourselves the possibility of thinking of ourselves in a different way and to feel in a different way while inhabiting a peaceful territory 
And for example, we accompanied this communi community in this Caqueta region, and we know that this has been one of the most affected areas by the armed conflict. And paradoxically, this has been one of the areas also most affected by environmental degradation after the signing of the peace accord. This is one of the areas that is undergoing the deforestation highest rates. So we have these paradoxes that have arised also from the peace accord signings, where the, the well, the deployment of, for example, the FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of the of Colombia, this guerrilla group, will basically left these territories, and we now see a new expansion process of deforestation activities. And we also have the Uruki territory. This is the rural settlement of El Manantial. This is a closer image, and these are territories used for extensive cattle, ranching, or livestock. And the community started a process of restoration of the environment and protection of water bodies specifically. And that is where we've seen it really interesting, but hand in hand with their community to think about interculturality as a bet within these reforestation processes with different indigenous communities. There are three indigenous peoples that are quite important inhabiting this region, and the others are people peasants mainly in their own land parcels that have also uh, been displaced in, in recent wars until so this area has been very interesting because the indigenous constructions also start to take a more important role and position not only as a spiritual but also as a political effort where the protection of environment and nature also brings other perspectives around what can the Amazon be, the jungle be, and therefore we start seeing frictions with, for example, Western landscape perspectives. And what's most interesting, and to be able to close with this most more academic part of my presentation, is that hand in hand with Arturo Escobar and a Colombian anthropologist, we've understood, together with his proposal, that when communities start these processes, they are betting. They're betting in the forth to the forthcoming future. They're designing that sense of belonging, but also how they would like this territory to be and how it would be inhabitable in the future. So when when Arturo Escobar identified all these communities, well, they basically carry out their their life plans, their consensuses on where to go. And we're designing, for example, these designing these life models and these territory models, the views models, accompany, accompaniment model, interspecies models in relation with nature. And so we start to see this design, designs or designs in transition, which I will later explain, that are exactly with, or go hand in hand with the desire of overcoming the current status of destruction by the different forces that operate in these territories. There are different transition models. For example, I want to show you this, this Climate Justice Alliance transitional design based in the US, where this transition obeys to a deep and profound change in the social, economic, and political structures. For example, instead of having extractive economies, what operates is instead where, where the nature is only seen as a source of resources and where we need, for example, militarism as governance, we must carry out a transition to a regenerative economy, a, an economy of care with a feminist perspective, collective perspective, where there is a regeneration and nutrition, constant relationship or dynamic in human nature relationships are where the power is actually from the most local level so that it's a deep democracy and not a dictated democracy such as the current ones where processes of militarism in societies are actually increasing. So I really like this scheme because this shows exactly transitions in this design where from the most local environment, communities are thinking in the forthcoming future and they are actually incorporating a notion of what is the, the transition of from the point of where we are and where we want to go towards to. And these, these are some of the activities that we're developing currently. And Vanessa actually commented on some of these. And we are also carrying out a process of recovery of collective memory. We want to carry out a baseline 
or design a baseline of well-being and good living? How are people considering this and how to contrast this also with Western ideas of well-being and quality of life? For example, it's very different. Harmonious relationships between nature and human beings and even harmonious um, interpersonal relations are quite different. We are supporting this with medicinal plants, also agricultural, sustainable agricultural processes, and also reforestation and recover and repairment of water bodies. And actually from Professor Regis seminar, there's, go there's undergoing an identification of different ecosystemic services and the benefits that, for example, fungi can also provide in these restoration processes. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, we now see as part of this process, Luis Augusto Perez has created this mapping of the different water supplies in the rural settlement of El Manantial. And what we can see is that many of the different water bodies are actually not part of the communities. So once again, we have these setbacks when we're thinking in terms of in, in, in terms of spatial areas, those limits that have been imposed by the bureaucratic exercise of nation of this nation state. And we've these are some investigation questions that we've tried to translate constantly and also that are an outcome of this accompaniment process. And we want to ask ourselves, for are these constitutive elements of this transitional design from the rural settlement of El Manayal and how these members of the community are negotiating these elements in their lives and as a group, how are or what are their aspirations towards the future and how these reflect conflicts or potential synergies between an anchor agenda in ecological capitalism and an understanding of decolonial and biocentric relations that relationships between human and natures and how this sense of the good living or buen vivir is can be conceptualized and perhaps measure the context of the construct of the peace building and different as for efforts of environmental restoration for example we want to know if this indigenous cosmogony also have or are harmonious or can be uh, coupled with these good living we these are some theoretical concepts for example ter territorial peace neoliberal environmentalism this would be the final design that we are just applying to different resources to gain to obtain different resources and any feedback that you have is much more than welcome this is a preliminary phase that we are advancing on and we will try to understand these more emergent concepts on the transition designs and the good living to be able to carry out a survey and carry out a pilot project and then apply it to a more extensive or extended uh, population in El Caqueta region to see effectively if we can contribute to the different discussions being held about the way in which we're seeing nature human relationships and what must change to be able to face the climate change that we're all suffering from and to be able to also advance on territorial peace building. This is what um, we wanted to share today with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we are going to have the presentation from the Aroa indigenous community. This is a cross-border community inhabiting in the north region of uh, Ecuador, bordering with Colombia. We will have Noel Armicha Guel Gonzalez, Mr. Roberto Paipus, Mr. Edgar Nastaquas, and Ma'am Doris Puchana. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Morning, everybody. Special greetings to you all from the large Aguabi Nacional family. I hope that you can see my camera. Yes, we can hear you and see you just fine. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. We've been having some connectivity issues, but okay, thank you. I first want to send you special greetings from the great Awa family. We are located in different territories and this is the Awa community. In my case, I am in the department of Putumayo. My colleagues, Edgar Nastaguas is in Nariño and Doris is also in Nariño. They belong to the Camaguari community and Roberto Teguz is from the Awa community centers from Ecuador. For this process, we are really sorry the audio is cutting off. Well, right now, 
we are not having good connectivity. This is because our panelists are located in rural areas, but we want to thank them for their, their efforts in joining us today. Can you hear me, ma'am? Mr. Amilcar, can you please turn off your camera and the connectivity would probably improve and we will just hear your audio. Mr. Amilcar, can you hear us? We will try again later. Yes, hello, good morning. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Thank you. You can continue, please. Yes, good morning. My name is Edgar. We're really sorry. We're not having good connectivity. The audio is cutting off. We're really sorry. I also want to thank the Agua family associated directly with the four organizations and also we have the indigenous unit of the Awa community we have the Casipa organization we have Kamawari we have the Kai and us I think that Amilka has their presentation so that they can tell us about it I don't know how their connectivity is, but I think that La Gran Familia Agua Nacional, we cover an extensive territory, including several departments in Nariño and Putumayo, and also in, in the Agua, we have our Agua brothers from Ecuador. So, I just wanted to start this presentation that we are showing you so that we can give you our presentation. Can you please let us know when we move on to the next slide? No, can you go back please? Here, for example, this is the great Awa family. We apologize. We cannot interpret because the audio is cutting off. Sucumbio, Ecuador, Nariño, Putumayo, and Nariño in Colombia. The administrative organization of the Awa communities is directly in Nariño. We have the indigenous unit of the Awa community. We have the cosmovision of the Awa peoples. We also have the four worlds that we mentioned. And here we have the indigenous unit of the Awa community. We have the Ricarte Awa Council. We have Kamawari, the Association of Awa Indigenous Councils of Potomayo. And we also have the Awa Federation of Ecuador. Can you move on to the next one, please? This is the cosmovision of the Awa peoples. 
of the great Awa family of the four worlds that we talked about. At the bottom, we have the our elders say that we are really sorry the audio is cutting off and we cannot interpret this is a long story and here the section in yellow that's where the spirits come in So this is the ancestral territory of the Awa national family. The territory here we can see it and it consists of the following rivers in Nariño and in Ecuador we have the river Hualcayaguario, Yambirio, Yataje, Rio, Yansabaro, Piedra Sellada, the Tortugaña River, the Chical River. In Colombia, we also have the Pialapirri River, Gran Rosario, the Lira River, Vegas River, the Turbia River, the Imbabir River, the Quejuanbir River, the Tigrillo River, the Baboso River, Tigrillo River, Lisa River. In Putumayo, in the province of Sucumbíos, we have the Guisa River, San Miguel River, Putumayo River. Orito River, San Juan River, the Vides River, the Guamues River, the Rumillaco River. I can't really see the next one, I'm sorry. The River, the Churuyaco River, Verde River, Guamayaco River and the Lora River. Can you go to the next slide, please? Can you go to the next one, please? Edgar, I can help you. Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Edgar. Thank you very much. We're really sorry. We have horrible connectivity here in Putumayo, and I actually thought that it was my connectivity, but it's actually, that's the situation all over the department in Putumayo. This, the connectivity is really bad. Thank you very much, Edgar, for starting the presentation. What Edgar was telling us was the great context of the location of the national Awa family. This is a territory that is geographically in the republics of Colombia and Ecuador. And for many years, for thousands of years now, our ethnicity has been living here in these territories. Without knowledge that we had a border and therefore it was fundamental for us to cross the river between Nariño to Ecuador and also to connect Potomayo with Ecuador because we have families on both sides. So just to summarize this because Edgar already explained this before. 
This is the reason why we talk about a binational territory, which is an extension of about 610,000 hectares that are recognized by the Colombian and Ecuadorian state, of which there are 480,000 hectares in Colombia and 130,000 hectares in Ecuador. So, in the Ecuadorian case, they are, we are present in the provinces of uh, Esmeraldas, Imbabura, Carchi, and Sucumbíos. Here in Colombia, we are located in Putumayo, Nariño, and in the municipalities. So can we move on to the next one, please? Also, as the Great Awa family, since the incorporation of the organizations in 1990, which are the organizations of the indigenous communities in Latin America, as the great family, we have focused on four principles, which are the guiding entities that are not negotiable, including unity, territory, culture, and autonomy. Unity because we have walk together as a single team or a single community so that we can connect with the territory. The territory, which is a sacred element, a living ed element that is present. So this element is cross-cutting as well as culture. In our culture, we also find the manifestation of everything that we do. And everything is interconnected. And the same with autonomy. Autonomy is the way of exercising our own governance. As we said, this is the way of exerting territorial governance because of all the situations that have happened in Colombia and in the border regions that have also expanded into Ecuador, which is armed conflict. And we need to defend and to walk with the indigenous guard to exert justice and to exert governance in our territory. For this reason, it is pertinent and it has been very important for us to be united. And also in the administrative organization, the AWA peoples, as Edgar said, I am just going to give you a brief overview of what my colleague already mentioned. We consist of four indigenous organizations, three in Colombia and one in Ecuador, two in Nariño, one in Putumayo, in, and one in Ecuador. And in the case of the UNIFA organization, we have about 30,000 inhabitants consisting of 33 protected areas spanning over 210,000 hectares. In Ricarte, we have an approximate population of 15,000 inhabitants, 11 reservation areas, and 107,000 hectares. In, uh, also, we have 7,800 inhabitants, 14 protected areas, 48 communities, spanning over a territory of 163,000 hectares. And our friends in Pecae, Ecuador, are grouped into 7,000 inhabitants, spanning over a total of 130,000 hectares. And this is a territorial context of our organizations. I also wanted to mention that this way of conceiving our four principles, they are present in our daily lives. And this is reflected in our cultural approaches. This cosmovision is also known as the four worlds. And also it is present in the first world where In the case of the Awa, they are the ones that live 
underground. The second world, which is Alasu, this is the Basu world, and the fourth world is Amasu. So these four worlds are the ones that create this integration and the cosmovision is what gives us the focus and that's why it's called in Caragua, the people of the mountain that protect the territories and protect the plants and we are located in a territory that is a fragile territory and biodiverse territory and also very strategic for the biodiversity of the planet not just because we are there but also because we are benefiting the entire world next please Thank you. As we said before, this is an extensive territory. We have also been experiencing the different problems. Unfortunately, this is a territory that is large, it's broad, it's, it's extensive, but we have also faced some difficulties related to the impacts and most of the impacts have been negative because because they have come from outside one of them would be climate change that has affected us greatly and also the ecosystems are more fragile and this is present throughout the border region between colombia and ecuador and also we have seen that we are subject to vulnerability because of natural disasters and also the development of external models such as capital neoliberal systems they are coming into the territory including mining activities oil activities and mining in ecuador as well is present and all of this is connected to the presence of armed groups and the, pros, the presence of illicit crops that have affected the territory, even though it's extensive, now we are also vulnerable to these factors. And this is one of the areas that we want to focus on because we need to start looking for partners and friends so that we can look for those initiatives that we will mention later on. Thank you. Next, please. Gracias. Thank you. The potential, as I have explained already, is the great forest presence that we have. This is not an economic potential in our standpoint, but it is the potential of what we can also. This is how we can help our planet to offer a better life from our regions and from our territories we also want to support the biological needs of the world so there is a large amount of forest mass we have a large extension of forests and rivers that unfortunately that fortunately are still conserved and they have not been uh, contaminated by cyanide and also the installed capacity that we have been finding in the territory and we want to dedicate ourselves to protecting the territory. Next, please. And with this, to contextualize a little further, I would now like to hand over to my colleagues who are connected. We have 
a couple of my colleagues, I hope that Roberto is able to join us. And they're going to talk about the different conservation initiatives and sustainable work we've been doing. So before I hand over the, the floor, I would like to thank Patrimonio Natural, CPF, WWF, who have, well, we've also, I'm sorry, been working with the World Food Programme, looking at issues of climate change. Because we have faced certain difficulties, the conservation initiatives are fundamental. So in our case, in ACIPAP, and we're in the foot of the mountain in Cauca. So in this area, our reserves have started to be organized in a strategic fashion. With conservation areas, so we can conserve animals and plants and traditional medicines that are absolutely fundamental, that do not have received sufficient attention in the pandemic. In the Chihuahua Reserve in Ipiales, there's an area of some 4,000 hectares where we're starting to see autonomous or independent border definition in primary forest and, of course, the protection of all of the biodiversity contained therein. In the reserves in the Putumayo, for example, the Stingue and the Cepa Verde and the Kawasan and the Amos Cavides Reserve, San Andres de Vegas, just to name a few. These are also pioneering reserves in seeking out conservation strategies for biodiversity and also for Cosmovision. And in Piemonte and Cauca, we have a community where there are approximately 4,000 hectares. And they have a special system in the Amazon area. And they use water from the Caqueta River and the Con Condor River. So we have these lagoons that are part of the community. And they work on this type of conservation. Two minutes left. That I would like to hand over to my colleague Edgar, then Doris, and then Roberto, so they can share their experiences. Thank you. Edgar, te escuchamos. Edgar, the floor is yours. Edgar is not currently connected, Emilcar. So if you'd like to finish the presentation, please go ahead. Doris, are you there or shall I wrap up? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Doris. Okay, so I would just like to introduce myself. I am Doris. I am the coordinator for the Gran Familia Agua. We are part of the Awa family. We're in Kalawa, and I'd like to talk about who we are as Awa people. We are the children of the mountains, and we have spiritual parents. And we are on the banks of a local river. And so that's why our name Awa means people of the jungle and children of nature, which is really what brings us here today. Because it's very important, land is very important for us as Indigenous people. 
And it's very important to talk about these matters that are fundamental for our communities because we protect these areas. We live in Ricarte, in the Nariño department. And so from 3,000 to 4,000 meters above sea level, we have organized ourselves into 11 reserves amongst 17 indigenous council areas. And we have land where we have tried, let's say, to take care to so this is our habitat this is where our birds are where our animals are and we have animals here that are not found anywhere else so looking at different types of animals so for us, it's extremely important to take care of our animals. The interpreter apologizes, the audio is dropping out, but we have our ancestors and we work for indigenous communities. In any case, we have had an impact looking at some of our colleagues there's been an impact due to the illicit crops found in the area. So yes, we have seen a negative impact. We've also seen crude oil spills that have polluted our water sources. And we have also been trying to speak to people in our territories to try to get them to stop deforesting. And it's about not growing uh, these kinds of crops because that will affect our trees. We want to avoid the planting of products that do not benefit the surrounding territories. And we are going to see significant consequences down the line. I would like to just offer this and highlight biodiversity. The interpreter apologizes, Doris's audio is dropping out. We have enormous wealth in water, in fauna and flora and birds in land, but we do have to be very clear that there is a risk in all of our territories and we have to look at how to care for this land. These don't only belong to us as indigenous peoples, but these lands belong to all of humanity who want to make a contribution and come in and see these beautiful places. And so I think that everything's been mentioned today is very interesting from the keynote speakers. And it's very important to look at these ideas. And so I just wanted to share what we do with my Indigenous colleagues here when it comes to the work we do in our Indigenous reserves. Thank you very much to all of you. Might I speak? Edgar, yes, please go ahead. Good morning. I am Edgar. I, the binational advisor for the Gran Familia Awa in Unipa, but I am from Agua Agua de Turbia Indigenous Council. So we have an organization that works with 27 reserves. We have also six reserves that are being constituted still. For us, when it comes to the impacts we've seen, more than anything else, it's been related to illegal mining and also crude oil spills and also the armed conflict, both legal and illegal. And we have also seen aerial fumigation and 
we have suffered with the spraying of glyphosate. That's where we have suffered greatly. But we have together cared for our territory with our indigenous authorities. And so we have been carrying out territorial control. And we also have impacts looking at palm growers in the UNIPA organization. We have five municipalities involved in this organization in Tumaco, Ricaurte, Roberto Payan, San Diego, and Barbacoa. And we are a very large territory, and that's important so that we can have direct coordination with different institutions and to work together with institutions and to tell people how we live as the Awa people, culturally and ancestrally speaking. So we want to live in peace, in tranquility in our territorial area and also live peacefully. So this is my contribution on behalf of the Awa people. We would like to continue to coordinate with other institutions to get together and converse, to share experiences as the Awa people, how we've lived and how we've suffered. Thank you very much. And I will be attentively listening here to the rest of the meeting. Thank you very much, Edward. Edgar, is Roberto now here with us? Okay, so in this case, we will now move on to questions and answers for our panelists. Okay, perfect. So this is for Doris. How has participation or female participation been growing in the Gran Familia Awa? Well, women play a fundamental role. As women, we are the direct protectors of Mother Earth. And so we are here to care for our land and to teach our children to also care for it. And so, the idea is to love our land and to find ways to ensure that our territories do not come to an end. And so I believe it's important for women to participate in these spaces because, as I said just a moment ago, if we create life, we are also the creators and protectors of everything that is around us of course, our land. It is important for us in the future as mothers to ensure that our children in a peaceful environment, but additionally, that they can also enjoy the cultural diversity that we have managed to preserve until today. Unfortunately, as I said just a moment ago, we have seen impacts in our territories. And so in many parts in our reserves, we don't find the same fauna and flora that we have seen elsewhere. So we have a very large reserve where there are species that are not found elsewhere. When it comes to birds, we have different types of frogs, different kinds of snakes. And we also have certain types of bears there. So this is what gives our territory life. And so this is very important because we are growing thanks to our women. And it's for this reason that our land has survived because we have made a contribution to caring for Mother Earth in different reserves around our communities in the Awa area. Thank you very much. Thank you 
Doris. Now we have a question for Michael Naipa. What strategies or initiatives do you believe can be advanced upon to respond to the enormous loss of medicinal ancestral knowledge that has been a consequence of the pandemic? Thank you very much. I think that this is uh, this loss of knowledge has been occurring for a long time now. I think what's most important is what we've just heard from our colleagues here in the panel. Yeah, in, it's important to ensure that land is given life, it's protected from pollution, contamination, destruction, and that the people who live in these areas have complete access to their territories and their nature. I think this is the most important thing to look at. And at the same time, from the outside, we can provide support with knowledge transfer that are meaningful for people. And I think that from the medical and political perspective, we have to put rights and the environment first. And secondly, be more open and more supportive of ancestral traditional manners of perceiving the world when it comes to treating illnesses, uh, well-being and health in general. Thank you very much, Dr. Nyper. And the following question is for Dr. Cesar Abadia. What implications do you consider are created by the accreditation that the transitional justice or going to say uh, institution or uh, jurisprudence has created for the most affected territories. What is your opinion on this? Thank you, Ana Maria. Thank you for the person who made this question. This is a very important and fundamental question. I think this obeys to the legal developments of acknowledging nature as a subject of rights. And I think that these legal developments should be highlighted that this come hand in hand with the struggle of indigenous peoples and that westernized peoples and communities such as us understand the role of nature in the conflict and that we start to invert the logic by which the human is always imposing itself um, or themselves over nature and that is a very important step to this acknowledgement and that from then on we can create reparation efforts and other type of initiatives such as protection as well because as we've listened to well definitely on one side we have the advances and progresses but on the other side we have the different commercial interests in terms of exploitation and degradation of the environment that will always be intention so i think that this is a fundamental acknowledgement and hopefully this unchains or triggers specific actions of protection and reparation to protect different indigenous and peasant communities that are carrying out, carrying out these efforts in the different territories. Thank you. Now for Liliana Paz and Joanna Bolaños, the great Awa family, how can academia support your community processes? Thank you for this question. Well, academia is fundamental because this is the entity that creates evidence scientific evidence, of course, and this is the aspect that can position all efforts of leadership in these different territories. This positions them at a national or international level. But I think there is something that is absolutely key, which is that from academia, we must also understand that we must articulate our language. We must standardize our language and translate it into a more understandable level. And we must also understand the different dynamics in these community processes and how we can contribute. We are simply this leverage in the path that motivates and directs these different communities. And we contribute scientific evidence and knowledge that we share in such a way that these communities can also become owners and position themselves from their initiatives at all levels. Ms. Bolaños, would you like to contribute to this question? I apologize, Nini. Nini had to leave this session. 
there's a public order situation in the area, and that is why she had to leave this session. So for now, she cannot reply, but I will forward this question to her. And through some communication channel, for sure, we will send her a reply. Thank you. Thank you. And from the Awa family, would this is a question. Please go ahead. So I believe I share um, the words. I support the words of the previous speaker. Well, our territory, as we have mentioned before, has been a territory that has been not explored enough. And I think that from at the academia, we must start seeking these strategic partners to be able to build and create knowledge and to start visibilizing this territory outside because the knowledge from our wise women and men and from traditional healers, well, without their have them having a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or PhDs, well, they have been key um, wise women and men in this relationship to this nature and in this pandemic, which hasn't really ended, they were the ones that saved our lives and territory because our traditional medical healers were the ones that brought the plants, the medicine plants, and these plants have healed and have saved the lives of people that were contagious by COVID-19. This is just an example. And likewise, I would like to invite universities to start partnering and to not only have universities come and um, identify knowledge and just uh, plot it or describe it in a book or an investigation article. They must, I think it should be our same community individuals, the ones that are perhaps finishing their secondary school studies and in the regions, well, for them to enter university, and we must also approach this knowledge closer to how we can create this knowledge from both sides, from the academia and our communities. Not only for the Awa peoples to strengthen, but also for the world to learn that we can also contribute to our society. Thank you very much. There is another question for you. So how can we, the audience listening to this forum, learn more about these ancestral territories and help take care of them? Well, I think that as a starting point, we have started out seeking strategies. The AWA is not a legal entity. It is a more political uh, kind of organization. And we are formed in the four organizations, such as the indigenous peoples of the AWA and the Cabildo, the great Cabildo of the Nariño Department, and also the Putumayo one, and also the Federation of AWA Centers in Ecuador. I think those are the main channels or the first instance through which we can start to communicate different efforts and all feedback and comments are welcome. And please, different guests and participants, you are welcome to learn more about the AWA community so that we can start creating and linking processes. We are aware that not only with economic funds, you can help our territories, but also with knowledge, with experiences, with experiences exchanges. And this surely will also help us assure this territorial governance and yet it's true that this only entails the territory however due to the different situations that we live violent events that we live in the country and that have been um strengthened in this post-conflict land uh, framework i think all your ideas will help us thank you very much we have more questions but due to time limits we will continue with the last intervention of today's session we want to thank our different panelists for your time we know the great effort that you've done from the awa family to be able to be online with us and we know are, are very aware of the connectivity difficulties in colombia which are pretty clear and thank you very much for your time and your disposition for being here as we will continue with our last workshop intervention this intervention is in charge of mr swang sing lee from the Hoover Institute, E-M-I-M-E, -E, by its acronym in Spanish, in English, before welcoming him, I want to know, I want to let you know that this institute is part 
and is a leader in applied sciences. He currently this currently operates in over 50 organizations in Germany. It has 29,000 employees, and most of these are engineers and scientists of world class level and manage a budget of 2.8 trillion euros. Dr. Lee is chief of control of vectors in this institute, and he has a PhD from the Max Institute in Evolutive, Evolutive Biology and also another degree from the Western Ontario University. He will be talking about the development of the Libro Blanco or White Book on the sustainable use of biological resources or the development of a white book on the fair and sustainable use of bioresources. And as I said, this is also from the Fraunhofer Institute. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. We are very pleased by your presence and I would like to give you the floor now. Thank you very much, Anna Maria, for this kind introduction and the opportunity to present you my talk entitled Development of a White Book and the Fair and sustainable use of bioresources. As Anna Maria pointed out, my name is Kwang Jin Lee. I'm working in a Fraunhofer Society. And to start my presentation, I would like to explain you what we are. So who are we? So our name stems from our name patron, Joseph von Fraunhofer, who lived around 250 years ago. And he was actually successful in three things. He was a successful scientist, successful inventor, and also successful entrepreneur. His topic was um, the manufacturing of optical lenses. And uh, with that, he was also able then to um, define this kind of dark absorption lines in the spectrum of the sun, which are now also now known as Fraunhofer lines. And our society took him as a role model because we are standing also for the three things, science, invention, and um, entrepreneurs. So Fraunhofer Society, when you see here around, we are headquartered in Germany. And um, there are 75 institutes and research units spread around Germany with around 30,000 employees, most of them being scientists or engineers. We have an annual research budget at the moment of 2.8 billion euro. And I just checked this is corresponding around 100 trillion Colombian pesos. And I will come to the financement model of Fraunhofer later in my presentation because I think it's kind of relevant. I just picked some examples that um, are interesting to know what Fraunhofer is working or um, inventing. So one is the use, for example, of environmentally friendly and sustainable production of latex or rubber from the Russian Dandelion. Another part is dedicated um, in the invention of light emitting diodes, where in 1994 Fraunhofer also invented the white LED depicted here. And the most well-known invention is probably the audio coding format MP3 that was invented from Fraunhofer and developed. So in the next picture, when you see here the locations that are circled, this is basically um, um, the locations of the Fraunhofer Institute for molecular biology and applied ecology. And the red circle, this is where we are. This is in Gießen, relatively close to Frankfurt. So we moved in into this new building around one year ago. And on the four floors, we are dedicated to insect biotechnology. Insect biotechnology, this is a term or yellow biotechnology, which was coined by the founder of this, um, of this uh, research field, Professor Andres Wyczynskas, who is professor at the Justus Liebig University in Gießen, and at the same time, the leader of the Fraunhofer Institute here in Gießen. And a definition of insect biotechnology is here. It's the development and application of biotechnological methods to use insects their molecules, their cells, organs, 
or their associated microorganisms to produce products or services for specific use in different fields of biotechnology like medicine, in agriculture, or in an industrial biotechnology. Question now is why do we use insects? As you might know, insects are the most abundant and numerous animal, animal order of family with for more than 1 million species that have been described. So they are representing one of the most diverse and are therefore evolutionary most successful group of organisms. And their biodiversity at a species level can be directly translated on a molecular level. So the insects represent an incredible compound library. And the insect biotechnology aims to explore and to develop this compound library for human welfare. I brought you some examples, not all because there are so many things that we are currently working on, but I think those that cover some parts that we are interested in. Depicted here, what you can see is the Asian ladybird, Harmonia exeridus. This species was initially used to control aphids or other insect pests in the um, uh, in greenhouses, but then it, it just spreads and um, has a negative impact on biodiversity. Uh, the good thing is what we found is following this ladybird is um, producing one natural compound that we named harmonine. And what it has here, it has antistatic and anti um, antibiotic properties against bacteria. Moreover, it has also been shown to be active against uh, Leishmania, malaria, and schistomiasis, as depicted here in a control. This schistocerca parasites are doing fine, treated with harmonine, they're not looking so good. So this is one example for the medical use or application from the findings um, that we have. And the next one is more on an agri agricultural part. Depicted here is Drosophila suzukii, or the spotted wing Drosophila. This originates from Asia and spread all over the world, also in the Americas, and has developed to a major fruit pest and uh, leading to damage in fruit production in the millions of dollars per year. The problem with the, um, this invasive pest is that the female can la lay the eggs directly under the, the shell of the, of the fruit where the eggs are hatching and the larva is developing within the fruit. So it's relatively late and it's also not really applicable for chemical insecticides. Coming to chemical insecticides here in Europe and also in the US, we have a more and more a ban of chemical insecticides due to their negative impact on biodiversity. What is needed therefore is uh, some alternative methods to control insect pests. And we are trying to work on that. So one candidate would be insect viruses for biological control. Why is that so? Because they are highly host specific, therefore sustainable and providing a selective control and they don't pose any danger to humans and the environment. As example, I brought you the apple cutting moss Cydia pomonella, here's the adult, here's the larvae within the apple. And down here you see a microscopic picture of the virus that is infecting specifically this codling moss, the Cydia pomonella granulosis virus that you can buy as a ready to use product and which is used in Germany at least 100% of ecological grown apples, uh, which uh, has um, application in over 70 countries. And we hoped to find something similar for Drosophila suzukii. And actually, this is fortunately what also um, came true. We found two different viruses, the Drosophila A virus, a Pamutotetravirida, which was not so interesting because it was known already for 30 to 40 years. Still, it has a 
effect when you infect the flies, they are dying faster than control flies. But the more interesting one is the LJV virus or the La Jolla virus, belonging to the family of the Eflaburida, which is also killing the fly when infected in the flies. You see in both cases that the virus is replicating within the flies. With some further analysis, we could depict that um, the virus are have an, um, based on RNA. Uh, we did some studies on the capsids and could do some initial electron microscopy. We could show where the virus is enriched in the insects. And to further optimization, we could um, optimize a protocol for um, getting high, um, highly purified virus particles depicted here with that we were able also in collaboration with um, other labs to get a crystal structure of the virus. So this would be the part of the agricultural uh, use projects. We are still developing the virus further for, um, for the use in agriculture. I'm coming now to the next topic, the work on pollinators and negative impacts on pollinators. Uh, we were working on honeybees and uh, we have several different projects. So one project is dealing with the mating biology. As you might know, the honeybee has a quite complicated um, mating strategy where the virgin queen is flying out and to certain spots where there are a lot of male honeybees waiting and nothing much is known about the um, chemical cues that are needed for uh, for this approach. So what we did is we used this uh, drone this, um, and attached kind of um, decoy queen. It's not a real queen, it's just a dummy uh, to attract the male honeybees. And then we tried to measure the differences in the air and check that also in the lab and do chemical analysis on this. This is one project. Another project is um, uh, based on the immune response of the honeybees or insects to um, ingested pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides or insecticides. We just um, studied the immune response of the honeybees. And we went a notch further. What you see here is a so-called apis chamber. And in this chamber, we could teach honeybees to differentiate different odors. So we could just score their learning behaviors. And what we find out is when we treat the honeybees with different uh, or sub lethal levels of pesticides, that this has negative impact on their learning behavior. So we are the, even if the insecticide is not directly killing the honeybee, it's enough that the learning capabilities of the honeybee is disrupted so that they cannot find um, their hive again and things like that. And I think this is also quite some interesting uh, work that we conducted here. The other topic is using, oops, sorry, using insects as a protein source for food feed. Um, this topic was already um, introduced to you on the first day of the workshop by Martin Czerna. We use also here as a model system, the black soldier fly Hermetia illusions, where you see the male and the female and the life cycle, including six larval stages. And also here, um, we try to make use of this incredible uh, um, possibility of those insects to transfer plant-based side streams, or to be honest, garbage from agriculture and food industry into, into proteins. So this side streams are used to feed the insects. And then those get separated by fractionation and analysis. So we can um, divide them in protein, chitin, fat, and fresh. And with that, we can uh, then conduct a knowledge-based optimization of the feed. One example here, when we add some additives to the food, what we can do is we can increase the amount of so-called antimicrobial peptides, which are beneficial also for the animals that are fed with this um, insect protein. 
Another thing is to use the frets or the faces of the insects as a fertilizer for agriculture. Here, we don't have just the effect that they use like the chemical compounds that are needed for, for plant growth, like nitrogen or um, phosphorus. But what we could also see, or what colleagues also showed, was that in this frass or in the faces of those insects, there are phytohormone like structures that increase the growth. And this was shown in rice. So, with that, uh, we try to create a low waste sustainability loop within. What are, low, uh, what are side streams? On the local side, what, in, what you can use in Germany is apple and wine pomers from apple juice and wine production um, side streams, or spent mushroom substrates, so from the mushroom cultivation. In Germany alone, you have 200,000 tons per year. Worldwide, it comes up to 30 million tons per year. When we go a little bit further, we could also use side streams of the palm oil industry, so using empty fruit branches and palm kernel meal for the feed or as a food source for the soldier flies. And with that, I will stop the first part to explain what we are doing and what we are interested in. And I would just talk a little bit what we are standing for. So I hope that I could convince you that uh, we are standing for technological breakthroughs in Germany, in Europe, probably worldwide. And we see us as a pacemaker for technological process. So where we transform innovation into future-proof applications. And this comes together. But technology, however, is not an end to itself, because technology has to benefit the people to give an added value. And this is the social added value. So we are thinking in application context and act in a benefit-oriented manner and develop sustainable social development. What does it mean? So we are living these principles in our, in our Fraunhofer society. This includes gender equality, strict compliance rules. So every employee has to run through anti-corruption programs and a code of conduct. To give you just very few examples. So where could Fraunhofer help Columbia Connect? So the sustainable development is based on three pillars, the access and benefit sharing, the local self-government, and the biodiversity management within the local, um, local communities. So what are the aims from Fraunhofer for Columbia Connect? I can start with, well, I can start with something what we are not aiming. So Fraunhofer is not aiming to explore the biodiversity of Colombia. What we are trying to do is to develop a fair and sustainable use of bioresources in Colombia. And for doing so, we want to discuss and communicate with all participants as equals to understand what are the challenges, problems, and need of every participant. Dos minutos. Mer, gracias. So we uh, built a framework for the utilization of biodiversity and natural resources and defined criteria for access and benefit sharing. In this way, we might act then as a consultant and create this called white paper or manual. And I see three contribution of Fraunhofer. The first contribution that I mentioned before, the financement of us. We are run by a Fraunhofer model, model the 70-30 rule. So we are not getting 100% of our income uh, by the government, as many other institutions or academia or university. 70% of our income we have to earn by ourselves by industry contracts or government projects. So the size of the budget relies directly on the success of maximizing revenues from our commissions. That's why Fraunhofer is quite customer and market oriented. And with that, we hope that we can help with some recommendation for establishing and consolidation of structures after the financement of Columbia Connect in Colombia. The second is creating value added chain for technological in inventions. So we had over 753 new inventions last year that are a result of a research and development of work at the Fraunhofer Institutes. And we hope that we can help them with our experience and expertise to develop functional value chains, um, for example, for the best practice um, examples in Columbia Connect. Uh, 
I think the third is the most important one. Fraunhofer has a long time experience in outreach to the political stakeholders, to industrial stakeholders. So um, in public relations, press releases, customer contact, uh, contact and so on. So our main support is in the coordination and creation of a white paper. What should be in this white paper? The content and aim. So the white paper itself is a fair and sustainable product to begin with. This open access, everyone can access it through the internet, and there will be at least the Spanish and English version of that available. And results and outcomes from the workshops that we are, um, are now here will be incorporated in the, in the white book. This includes reviews, best practice examples, and case studies. This might aim to help, the, uh, the aim is to help the participants, participants to understand the challenges and serve probably as a guideline for decision making. To sum it up, uh, we would like to build up some recommendations in this white paper for conducting fair and sustainable use of the bioresources. Thank you very much for your attention. If you're interested of what Fraunhofer is doing else, please check out this link here. This is a video in English that you can just check out or our web page. And with that, thank you again for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions that might remain. Thank you. Dr. Lee, muchísimas gracias por su intervención, por su presentación. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. Now I will give the floor to Mr. Esteban Peters. He's a PhD and professor of the Gieson University and also the academic director of the Columbia German Institute for Peace. He's our host. Dr. Peters, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ana Maria. Thank you very much to all the participants who joined us today in this session or who have joined us in the past four days as well. I think that we have had four fruitful and interesting days with very with many new ideas and perspectives also from different standpoints from the academia from the civil society from the public institutions and others so i am i can say on behalf of all the institutions that have participated in this workshop i can say that we are very happy and content with the with this workshop and i think it's also the time to say thank you we want to thank all the people who have participated in the workshop as speakers as panelists or as participants and who have asked questions and made comments throughout these four days of course to the entire team, I am not going to mention everybody because you are always at risk that there are other people out there too. But yes, we want to thank the moderators and Ana Maria as well for connecting these couple of days to Vanessa and Marta and the people who made the wonderful interpretation job. I know and we know that that is very important so that we can communicate with each other, but it's also a very demanding uh, job. So thank you very much for your wonderful work. But I would also like to give special thanks today, especially to the leaders, the social leaders and community leaders who have joined us today, despite the difficult public situation, the humanitarian situations, and we are truly thankful for this because we also know that the situation is very difficult and complicated. And at the same time, it's also very important for us to hear your voices, listening to your perspectives so that we can truly fulfill our objective, as we have mentioned many times in these four days. It is about the fair and sustainable use of our bioresources. And to be able to reach that goal, we it is 
important to hear all stakeholders, all the people and all the communities, and especially the people living in the territories. So once again, thank you very much. So with this, we conclude the first interdisciplinary workshop of Columbia Connect, the fair and sustainable use of our resources in the framework of peace organized by the Colombian German Institute for Peace. Thank you very much on behalf of the Institute and to all the people who have organized this event and who have worked arduously in the five past months to be able to organize this interesting agenda and to have the participation of high level global panelists. If you wish to have more inform information about Columbia Connect, you can fill out the form that is in the form and in the YouTube streaming channels. And we will also be presenting our bulletins and we will be inviting you to other workshops of this kind. We thank you for your participation. Have a very good afternoon. La coca de todo representa a la mujer, es la palabra, la vida, la enseñanza. Es a través de ese elemento para nosotros sagrado, alimenticio y espiritual, en donde nosotros trabajamos, hacemos reuniones, aprendemos canto, medicina, y por tanto hay que cuidarla. Y siempre va acompañado de la ambil. El tabaco es en sí la sangre de Mobo y Neyma, que es la esencia, el hálito del creador, y por eso que lo utilizamos como dos elementos fundamentales para la cultura vitota. Y lo que primero hacemos es sacudirla, limpiarla, y en cierta manera saludarla, porque como es mujer, hay que acariciarla, y decirle para qué es que lo necesitamos. Y no se raspa, tiene que ser ojeadito, de abajo hacia arriba. Después de, de limpiar, y le va pidiendo las intenciones que queramos, para qué es que lo vamos a sacar. O qué vamos a hacer con esa hoja para que ese espíritu, como para nosotros es humano, entonces nos pueda inspirar. Lo contrario, no nos inspira porque pues no lo respetamos o no lo apreciamos. ¿Por qué no sirve? Porque si la utilizamos, lo quemamos, eso nos puede cortar la boca. O en su efecto nos da anemia, nos da ciertas enfermedades, digamos, intestinales. Pero que hay que buscar la hoja que esté alto o seca como esta. Te vamos a buscar más hoja. Por ejemplo, esta, vean. Si está alzado, esta es la que nos sirve para... Ya para la mezcla. Se la partimos con mucho cuidado y bien limpiecita. Y esta la recolectamos. Y con esta es que ahorita vamos a mezclar lo que es el mambe. Para entender el mambe que llamamos, ya es el producto de la misma coca, pero ya para alimento espiritual. Alimento que nos sirve para lo que vimos anteriormente, para concentrarnos, para la enseñanza, para el trabajo para el aprendizaje, y ese tiene una mezcla, para que sea el mambe, como lo llamamos, tenía que llevar el yarumo. Pero la coca en sí, pues, tiene otro significado. Nosotros le decimos hibie. Hibina fue la mata de coca. Entonces, ahí es una diferencia cuando ya es elemento para nosotros utilizarlo aquí en las malocas. Mambiar es aprender y también mambiar es consumir estos elementos, es meterlos, digamos, para la concentración, porque eso es lo que nos da el conocimiento, la inteligencia. En eso se diferencia porque no solo el consumir, sino aprender. Ese término lo conocemos como, el, como mambiar. La maloca que decimos, o sea, la nánico, es mujer y cómo participa, pues, en las actividades del trabajo. Eh, no en cuanto, digamos, que tiene que ya consumirla, sino es la parte del aprendizaje. Ella así no consuma, pero ella está mambiando. O sea, de parte de, de la enseñanza, ella alcanza a, a mambiar el conocimiento. Entonces, entramos ya a prender el fogón. 
para empezar a deshidratar. No to Es como enseñanza se canta. Se dice, si, 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 tenere, cu, tenere, cu, si, 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 tenere, cu, tenere. Algo solo que sea dulce, para que el mambe salga bien dulcecito y con toda el rigor del caso. Y ya cuando siente que está como seca la soja, entonces con el mismo fogón, ya el que va a quemar el yarumo ya está listo, escucha, el oído suena. Escuchemos ya cómo suena. Los cantos o tal, porque es la manera de enseñar, porque la, los aprendices pues está escuchando al mayor o al tostador o dependiendo quién sea y está ahí va recogiendo la enseñanza y dice así cantaba mi abuelo cuando tostaba entonces como un ejemplo de vida no lo haga por pereza o por vicio no porque este no es paso o sea como hay que hacerlo con cariño o sea como dice una comida con amor para que alimente para que nutre igualmente como es para todo y lo otro que pues es colectivo, cada mambeador tiene sus funciones. Unos que, que saca las hojas, otro que alista el yarumo, otro que pila, otro que cierre, porque es un proceso colectivo, porque pues es para el consumo general y es el vivir del indígena durante muchos tiempos y y seguir manteniendo el legado que nos da Mopo y Naima. Este ya es el rito como tal, que es la, el compartir la palabra, porque esta es la hoja. Y aquí es donde le enseña ya la igualdad, que nadie es superior a nada. Todos tenemos la capacidad de, en cierto lugar, aportar y enseñar. Las cosas dulces, las palabras, es nuestra lengua. Es para hablar, para cuidar, para proteger, para sostener la futura generación a través de la hoja de coca, a través de la mata de tabaco. Y es palabra de sanación. La coca de todo representa a la mujer, es la palabra, la vida, la enseñanza. Es a través de ese elemento para nosotros sagrado, alimenticio y espiritual. Diseño y prueba de una estrategia de innovación social de turismo científico de naturaleza en el territorio ancestral del pueblo Aguá, departamento de Nariño. Es una iniciativa interinstitucional que busca diseñar e implementar, en co-creación con la Comunidad Ancestral Agua del Departamento de Nariño, una estrategia de innovación social basada en el uso sostenible de la biodiversidad del territorio. Para lograr este objetivo se generan estrategias de articulación entre el turismo científico de naturaleza, la investigación y la conservación biocultural de los ecosistemas presentes en la Reserva Natural La Planada y el Resguardo Pialapí Pueblo Viejo. Y me he sentido muy feliz estar reunida con mis compañeros indígenas, los de la universidad y los del instituto, ya que en estos días, en el primer módulo de trabajo, digamos, he aprendido mucho, tanto de los compañeros eh, de la universidad, 
del instituto y también de mis compañeros indígenas. Allí he aprendido un poco sobre la historia propia de nosotros y de los, de los otros, pues he aprendido cómo es la línea base, me ha llamado mucho la atención lo del turismo, porque eso es lo que se va a hacer aquí en la reserva. Se busca incrementar el conocimiento sobre la biodiversidad y aspectos sociales y culturales de la Reserva Natural La Planada y del resguardo de Pialapí Pueblo Viejo, a través de procesos participativos que permitan el análisis de capacidades técnico-científicas y operativas actuales y requeridas, la co-creación de la Estrategia de Innovación Social de Turismo Científico de Naturaleza y un piloto de validación del producto. Eh, esto, digamos, que nos reta a nosotros para eh, poder socializar con cada una de las personas que nos están acompañando, eh, aprender eh, también. Es un intercambio. Realmente sí viví día a día ese objetivo de aprendizaje en doble sentido, ¿no? en doble vía y en los diferentes escenarios, tanto en el auditorio, en el aula, en el comedor, en las secciones, en las sesiones de trabajo que hicimos en campo. Entonces me parece muy enriquecedora y es un, a nivel de investigación un tipo de experiencia nuevo para mí. Y este proyecto nos da la oportunidad de crear nuestra propia definición de qué es turismo científico para la Reserva Natural La Planada. Y nos, pues vamos a construir esa definición. Lo que pasa es que en aula eso nos va a tomar más tiempo. Sí, sí, sí. O sea, vamos a llegar ahí. Este proyecto es muy bonito porque es como co-creación, ¿no? Se para y pone. Eh, el otro año, gracias a Dios, esta... esta esta, esta reserva natural la planada es mi escuela, es como una universidad. El otro año casi yo no podía expresarme así frente al público porque me daba miedo, decía dos palabras y ahí quedaba. Eh, ahora, gracias a Dios, eh, estoy muy comprometido con la reserva natural la planada y quisiera seguir fortaleciendo hasta lo último. Proyecto ejecutado en la Reserva Natural Aplanada, en el resguardo Pialapí Pueblo Viejo, con el apoyo de la Gobernación de Nariño, la Universidad de Nariño y el Instituto Alexander von Humboldt. These are the protagonists of the best practice project of Colombia Connect here at Justus Liebig University in Gießen, Germany. Shrimps, or more precisely the Pacific White Leg Shrimp, Litopaneus Baname. Nowadays, half of the globally consumed fish is not caught from the sea but produced by women and men in aquaculture systems. This is driven by stagnating global catches of wild fish since many of our oceans are fished at maximum capacity. To alleviate some of the pressure on these valuable aquatic ecosystems, aquaculture is a key player and will continue to be one for many years to come. But sadly, as we do so often, by trying to find a solution for a problem, we create several new ones. 
In this case, while trying to produce more and more animal protein to keep up with the demand of a growing human population, we face the dilemma that feeding these animals is very resource intensive and challenging. To increase production volumes, the feed has to satisfy very precisely the physiological needs that emerge in highly intensive production systems. For many fish species, for example, it is essential to have a specific minimum protein content in the diet. The main protein source utilized in aquaculture feeds are fish meal and soybean meal, both bringing new problems to the table. Fish meal is produced by reducing small pelagic fish into fish meal and fish oil. While it is an excellent source of protein, it does not help our problem of providing food without depleting our oceans. In contrast, it may even make it worse. We have to take a significantly larger amount of fish out of the sea than we will be able to produce with the resulting feed. The second largest protein source in aqua feed is soybean meal. But soybean cultivation is associated with another set of problems, ranging from widespread deforestation, for example in many parts of Brazil, as well as monoculture cultivation with a high use of pesticides, resulting in a loss of biodiversity. Additionally, economical dependencies of farmers are often reported due to licensing practices of multinational companies for particular highly productive soybean cultivars. In order to unlock the full potential of aquaculture as a sustainable food source in the future, we have to come up with alternative and sustainable protein sources. And this is where this organism comes into play, the black soldier fly, Hermetia illusens. As many other insects, the black soldier fly, or shortly BSF, also has a very clear task in nature. It is very efficient at recycling decaying organic matter. BSF larvae can feed on a wide variety of organic substrates and turn them into valuable protein. This talent predestines them to be used as feed ingredient in aquaculture. Additionally, insects are part of the natural diet of many different fish. In fact, when we go fishing, we have been using insect larvae as bait for many generations because it works. Therefore, many scientists around the world are investigating how we can realize the mass production of insects as a feed ingredient for livestock by utilizing organic agricultural side streams or even, on a smaller scale, household wastes. That way, we can reduce organic waste streams, decrease the pressure on our ecosystems and produce a highly valuable protein in the spirit of a circular economy. To understand how these insect-based aquafeeds perform in shrimp aquaculture systems is our main goal here at Justus Liebig University. Since we are more or less in the middle of Germany, far away from any actual seawater, we rely on so-called recirculating aquaculture systems, or shortly RAS, where the water can be reused for a long period resulting in an efficient and more sustainable system in itself. This is possible through a smart utilization of filter systems, both mechanical and biological, to reduce the nutrient load of the water. Additionally, a UV irradiation system in cooperation with an ozone treatment is able to keep possible pathogens in check. All this enables us to test different feed formulations and investigate the influence of insect feeds on animal growth, various fitness parameters and the general well-being of the white leg shrimp. By combining these two innovative systems, the recirculating aquaculture and the insect-based feed products, it is possible to grow any aquatic organism anywhere on the planet and produce food for human nutrition where its demand is highest, directly inside metropolitan areas. Moreover, it is possible to do that in a very sustainable way that preserves precious water resources, recycles otherwise lost nutrient systems, and helps to mitigate some of the adverse impacts of human population growth on a global scale, therefore directly contributing to the sustainable development goals of the United Nations.